Jeff, you always intended to be a film director, but your life took a different turn? Sort of. Um, I mean, earliest memories, I was coloring uh, on the walls with crayons and getting in trouble and, you know, writing little stories and stuff like that. And then uh, I was like 12, I took a summer uh, one-week animation program and just fell in love with the moving images, seeing my drawings come to life and became obsessive about that and met a lifelong friend there, uh, cinematographer Jaron Blaschke, and he and I in high school decided, hey, let's try live action. And then realizing people move on their own, you have to draw them a thousand times to get them to walk across a room. Uh, just fell in love with that. And um, so really since, you know, at least my teens, the moving image and filmmaking and storytelling through that medium really helped. Um, was in some little uh, festivals, uh, the Portland, uh, uh, what was it the Portland Young People's Film Festival uh, had a couple of early awards there and stuff like that so and just getting the audience feedback was so addictive too um, and so yeah it was kind of a you know at least a childhood goal for sure and art school was <laughs> kind of a compromise I did a I did a year of it uh, before dropping out but I always loved you know I had a background in drawing painting all that sort of stuff and just love all mediums really and uh, but um, but yeah, I kind of just felt like filmmaking and art in general is in brain surgery. So after a year of film school, moved to New York and started PAing and just kind of finding my way from there. And when did you come to Los Angeles? Uh, five years ago now. Um, it was after Frey came out. Uh, I had a handful of people telling me I'd be an idiot not to live in LA if I wanted to keep pursuing that course and taking advantage of those opportunities. and. I would try to fly back and forth a handful of times and you know you'd set up meetings and stuff like that and then you arrive in LA you've got a few days and they're like oh can we push the meeting back to next week and it's like uh, no <laughs> and so <laughs> um, after a while I was just like yeah I kind of need to be out here and also there had been an exodus from New York of a lot of my colleagues and friends had been coming out here so when I came out to LA I actually had a better creative circle of people to, uh, to join um, so it just seemed like a natural progression to come out here, better way of life, um, more space. I mean, this room alone is bigger than any of my apartments in New York. Uh, so it's just, it's a better, it's a better, for me, it's been a better creative and professional choice for sure. Your directing reel is gorgeous and you have so many artistic shots, even of the yeah. client work that you've done. You can really see the, the detail and the angle and how you, you, you know, the composition. Was that your plan all along to sort of pay the bills doing client work and then make indie films on the side? Not a bad plan, by the way. Yeah, um, I've been really fortunate in that regard. Uh, way back, you know, I was trying to make it work. I was waiting tables and busing tables and doing whatever odd jobs I could back in New York and was really trying to find ways to get my freelance career up and running. I mean, I did everything from, and this dates myself a bit, but I did a public access TV show for a while. Um, I was just constantly trying to find ways to do things and then I fell into doing some music videos early on which was great um, but uh, even then wasn't a you know enough to support myself and a few evictions and uh, apartment changes later I was like I gotta figure this out and fell into kind of the world of doing fashion videos first it was internals then it started being in-store videos and then after a number of years of doing that, I was doing commercials for a couple of notable fashion brands. And that was just a great experience because you're working with some of the top fashion photographers in the industry and kind of learning a lot from them about lighting, composition, um, just framing and what that does to a, the perception of a person, um, working with great stylists and hair and makeup teams and uh, creative directors that had so much to add to the aesthetic aspect of filmmaking, um, which just, I think, heightened the storytelling sensibilities as well. And then also, as a way to pay the bills, it's great. <laughs> um, you know, even, uh, even the small jobs are, uh, there's always something that you're learning from it. It's, uh, you know, getting to see different locations. I mean, one of the locations that uh, my new film, uh, Blood From Stone's based around, I discovered while on a shoot. We were doing a shoot in Nevada and we were staying in Laughlin and I was just walking on the river walk in Laughlin. I'm like, this is an amazing, you know, you got the casinos on one side and this raging river on the other side. And it was just such a surreal place. I'm like, I got to shoot something here one day. So. Would, 
Oh, sorry, Adam. That's okay. I'm sorry. Was that part of uh, where the main character, the protagonist, where she was jogging at night? Yeah. Yeah, that was okay. that exact river walk. And in fact, the same stretch, I was having that thought process while I was walking it. Um, yeah, it was, uh, uh, there was just, we were staying in one of those casinos and I, I actually uh, just went for a walk one night and walked all the way along the river and across the other side. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just such a fascinating place. Uh, and even in the casinos, I mean, the casinos in Laughlin are a different breed than the ones I was familiar with in Vegas, the big, glitzy, glamorous ones. They're a little more quaint, a little more rundown. Uh, clientele is a different type of clientele. And it was just, it was, there were so many stories just happening there at any given time that I just kind of had a fascination and, and a bit of an obsession and just always had that place in mind. And then this story just worked so well with. Yeah, I think Reno is like that as well, parts of yeah. it. I don't know if you've been there. Definitely. But there is a, a sort of a nice, uh, I don't know if this is the right word, but desperation that's added into yes. the storytelling yeah. that I think works so well with that, with that, uh, you know, the gambling and the, and the money. It does. And that's, I mean, I'm a big fan of uh, location symbolism in my films. I mean, I've got the two features to speak for that. Frey was obviously, you know, shooting the, the epic forests of, uh, of the Pacific Northwest and including the logging industry into it as sort of a metaphor for what happens to our men and women who we send off into combat. Um, and uh, with this one, it was similar. It's a movie about vampires and what better place than casinos <laughs> for uh, the symbolism of just these machines that suck the, the life savings out of people. Uh, and, you know, so it was, it was kind of a natural fit as well. It's like, where else would you know, those that have to only exist at night be able to have a normal existence in a casino town that never sleeps. So, um, so yeah, it was a very, uh, to me it was, I like exploring that within the film, the making the locations and the environments a part of the story, the symbolism the th and themes throughout it. Cause it just, you know, it gives, when I did Frey actually, it was, I almost thought I was just being pretentious by doing that. <laughs> um, I was like, oh, nobody's going to pay attention to this. I was really pleasantly surprised how many people in audiences would talk about that afterwards, about, about the symbolism of the, the forest, seeing the, the logging and the, the wood splintered by the machines and him cleaning up the debris of that juxtaposed with him dealing with his own physical wounds from war. And uh, then the peace you would find out in the forest with these big, tall standing trees and uh, the quiet there and just that back and forth. It was amazing to see how that spoke to audiences and how how much they pulled from it. And so I kind of was inspired to just keep going with that in this film and uh, really weave so much of the environment into the actual storytelling itself. Not just cool places to shoot, but what do they say? Uh, some of the places we shot at were very, very historic places. Uh, Pioneer Saloon has been there since I think 1912 or 1913, it's an old frontier saloon that it still has a bullet hole in the tin wall from an, a gun, you know, a gunfight back in the old days. And um, we had uh, Atomic Liquors, which is uh, the oldest freestanding bar in Las Vegas where people would go watch the atomic bomb blasts uh, back in the day while having some cocktails. Um, and uh, El Cortez Casino, which is the oldest independently owned casino in Vegas and still keeps so much of its original character and all those things to kind of play with the idea of the symbolizing the old world and the old eras contrasting with our new eras that's trying to, you know, a arise or, uh, from, from these old eras. And so bringing a lot of that symbolism in through those location choices, I think, I think helps uh, really bring the, the film together in a much more uh, realistic and fleshed out way. Hoping to go back to your film that was about military personnel yeah. returning to civilian life. And so that was based on a family member or it loosely was. based? Yeah, yeah, loosely based. Uh, my cousin Ben, he was a Marine in Iraq and did multiple tours. And, you know, he and I growing up, uh, you know, we we're close cousins. We lived in different states. At the time I was in Montana, he was in Oregon and Washington. And, uh, but we'd always meet up at grandparents' place and play military and I'd be the commander. He'd be my little soldier. And then, you know, flash forward 15 years later and he's in the Marines and I'm an artist. 
Um, but uh, you know, he was in a he was in an IED attack over there. Uh, his leg uh, was hit with shrapnel, and then through an ambush, a bullet also hit him, and um, obviously hospitalized for a long time. And when he came out, I was visiting home and saw him over the holidays, and. We we're talking about it, and he just said something that was mind blowing to me. He said, uh, "You know, he was fortunate because he had a family that he could go and stay with, but dealing with like a lot of the bureaucracy around um, the, uh, you know, support for the veterans." Uh, he was saying that a lot of the guys he knew in the hospital went straight from the hospital to the streets if they didn't have a place to go because their disability pay would take so long to uh, to be able to come in, and that just boggled my mind and so I spent about two years on and off in my free time just getting to know a lot of homeless vets, uh, a lot of them in New York, went down to DC and met uh, a couple and just wherever I would go I would try to find uh, someone to speak to and just hear their stories and some of them I spent a couple days with walking in the distance just kind of observing seeing how people portrayed them, how they handled social situations. Uh, one of them was sleeping in a car out in the woods. Uh, another one I spent a night under a bridge with, uh, just trying to, as much as I could, understand that and then bring it to life in, in a way that I was hoping for other people like me who were naive about the reality that our combat vets face coming back home. I was hoping it would be an eye opener to kind of walk in their shoes for an hour and a half and get a sort of unflinching look at the struggles, um, emotional, physical, uh, systemic, and social that they deal with. Uh, and I was pleasantly surprised when it all came out that veterans themselves, who I didn't think would be as into it because they've already lived it, <laughs> um, but how it really became an important film for a lot of, of actual combat vets who felt like watching that they did they're like well if some filmmaker told the story it must not just be me um so it helped some of them realize that they're not alone in that struggle that there's others out there that are dealing with those same issues you know they have such a self-reliance that's bred into them through through their military training through you know they're literally i mean they're forces of nature when they're in combat and they come back and they're dealing with these issues and it's almost an embarrassment to admit that they're dealing with depression, that they're dealing with social isolation, financial issues, all that sort of stuff. And so to, to showcase it in that way where they can see that this is a systemic issue, it's not a personal flaw of theirs, um, that it's something that's happening to a lot of people, it's great to see that response to it as well. Um, obviously it was something that was personally really important to me. Uh, and it was also, in my own way, I'm something that's politically, I, I try not to be too heavy handed in my films, but I was very much an anti-war advocate back in the early days and still am, uh, but the early days of those wars. And it was, to me, it was a way to make an anti-war film that would speak to pro-war people and let them see, you know, it's not, um, it's not about uh, whether the war was right or wrong, it's about the aftermath of it. And so if you're going to start a war, think about the consequences of it, what you're going to be doing to those men and women we send over there. Uh, and so that, w it was great to see the conversations that it started. I mean, for such a small film, it really, uh, I was proud of the impact it had. Right. I, did you watch a lot of films like Coming Home and things like that from the Vietnam era? Uh, this is almost embarrassing. I didn't even know about the film Coming Home until uh, one of the reviews of Frey actually mentioned, like compared it to Coming Home. I was like, oh. Um, I would actually I hadn't seen Rambo, the first one at the time. I'd seen some of the later ones. I hadn't seen the first one at the time. Um, I hadn't seen Born on the Fourth of July, uh, but I had seen Hurt Locker. I'd seen Apocalypse Now, Platoon. So I'd seen a lot of the actual war movies and some of them that touch on those aspects of the coming home experience. Um, but one of my main things about it was some of the, the kind of newer breed of films that was coming out around that time about the war and about that experience, I felt like there was still so much melodrama that was brought into it, um, almost like a Hollywoodization of the story. And because it was such a low budget film, it was just mine. I had the commercial career to survive on. 
I wasn't concerned if it ever made a dime. I just wanted it to make one that showed it in its most authentic way. Um, even Brian, the actor who played uh, the main character, uh, you know, he spent some time with uh, a home for, uh, kind of like a halfway home for uh, homeless vets that are dealing with like addiction issues and stuff like that. Got to know a lot of them really well. And one of our main focuses on it was to, you know, there was no score in the movie. His acting was very naturalistic. Um, there's only a few big flare-ups. A lot of the time it was more him trying to suppress those, those feelings and not show his weaknesses uh, or what he was struggling with. Um, and it was like if at any moment this feels like someone's watching a movie, you and I have failed. You know, we would talk about like as an actor and as a director, we failed if this feels like a movie. Uh, we wanted it to feel like an experience and one of the best compliments I've ever gotten, and Brian as well, uh, was after our premiere, there was a gentleman there who was a Marine combat vet, and he, he told Brian, he's like, every moment of that film I've lived, and a lot of it I still live every day, and I believed you were a Marine up until I saw you do push-ups. And I was like, no, he's an actor. <laughs> 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 so it was just, it was great to see that kind of response. I mean. It was, it was a gamble, um, you know, it's not an exciting film. It's a very, uh, as a buddy put it, he's like, I'm not, I didn't enjoy it, but I'm really glad I watched it. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's a film that's a challenge for, for the audience. It's supposed to be a little upsetting. It's supposed to be slow at times, it's repetitive. It shows his day-to-day -day cycles of dealing with the same issues over and over again and how that unravels his, um, almost his willingness to cope with it. And, uh, um, you know, there's no loose ends that are tied up at the end. Characters drop off left and right because oftentimes when a PTSD attack happens, a lot of the vets I know, they would just flee. Um, you know, they would disappear, they'd go inward and it would, uh, sever tie they would sever ties with people. And so address that in there. So characters don't have arcs in it because a lot of times in life there isn't a full arc. Um, so it's not, a, it's not a typical story in that way, but I thought it was essential to do it that way because it's the most effective way to express the real struggle of somebody like that. And I think you said that you had maybe thought of doing a documentary, but you couldn't bring yourself to film them. So then you turned it into a narrative? Yeah. Is that correct? That is, that's exactly it. I really, you know, a lot of those vets that I was going around and meeting and getting to, you know, to try and understand it, I was, I would bring a camera with me with the intent of at some point getting them on camera talking about it and showing their life. But, you know, a lot of them were fairly guarded about this. Again, it's not something that, you know, nobody's proud of being homeless. Nobody's going to talk openly about it. And a lot of them were embarrassed at where they were at, didn't like to admit the struggles they were having. And even just the fact they trusted me to open up to and to let me do that. I mean, sometimes it would take a few meetings for them and um, to get to really be comfortable with me and understand that I had the best of intentions and was just there to listen, um, not coming in with an agenda. And so by the time they would finally open up and start talking about it, the last thing I wanted to do was throw a camera in their face. I was just like, that just felt to me vulgar to even think about. So I would just sit and listen and, um, you know, almost be a, just somebody for them to talk to. Uh, and it was amazing how, how much they were willing to share with me for that. And so I just realized, like, I can do, I can do inspiring documentaries for somebody who's talking about overcoming adversity. I can talk, you know, do that kind of thing. But getting into, like, the, that... I actually had the pleasure of meeting uh, Eugene Jarecki one time and asked him how he does it because some of the interviews he does are, I mean, I, I had just seen uh, The House I Live In and he's interviewing a guy who's been sentenced to prison, you know, a 20-year-old guy, and uh, asked him afterwards, like, how he, how he can even do that. And he's like, he's, I can't remember his exact words, but something like, I feel like a monster doing it, but I just keep on thinking about the end goal. It's like, this is more important for other people to see this than for me to feel good about recording it. Um, and I admire him as a documentarian to be able to overcome that sense of guilt in that moment. But uh, for me, it was just easier to take in all of that and then craft it into a, a narrative based on those real stories and tell it that way. 
And I also feel like in the end it was the right choice um, beyond just my own creative struggles with being a documentarian. Um, it was the right choice because it reached an audience that a documentary m would not have reached. Uh, you know, people that were open to watching it in its film form, uh, form may not have been as open to it in a documentary, which oftentimes documentaries are kind of perceived to already have a political or social agenda. This film wasn't necessarily perceived that way, and overtly it doesn't. Um, it just kind of shows this is what it is, make of it what, what you will. Uh, but yeah, uh, so that's a part of why the film had that naturalistic tone. And even the, the short film you'd mentioned was sort of an experiment to see if I could pull it off because I, I hadn't done a very naturalistic film before. My shorts and experiments before that were a little bit more in the, uh, I would say in the, uh, you know, Oliver Stone over the top sort of mold. <laughs> Um, so it was a new way for me to kind of go into this more natural, realistic approach. And uh, um, yeah, I'm glad I did it that way because it, uh, it was a huge learning curve for me as well as just an incredible experience. At what point did you realize though, this is not just going to be a little indie film that'll live on YouTube? I think you said just for a few friends to see. At what point yeah. did it cross over to a new, new audience? It really, yeah, it was, uh, when I started up on it, I definitely had the sense that nobody was going to watch it. <laughs> um, like, this is just, I mean, it's not a, it's not a fun movie to, to watch. And, uh, um, you know, even the festival circuit, uh, which was a fascinating thing on its own, uh, you know, we started getting awards, which I was shocked by. Um, and, uh, um, but even then, like with the distribution process, you know, signed up with Indie Rights and Linda and Michael at Indie Rights are just godsends. They're great people. Uh, but um, it was literally the day of our premiere, our theatrical premiere in, uh, in LA here. And I was on the balcony with Linda and we'd just gotten the LA Times review where we had a quarter page review with our picture, you know, picture from the film and it was a phenomenal review. And Linda says to me, she's like, you starting to think maybe you have a good film now? I'm like, everybody else seems to think so, so I guess so. <laughs> um, it really, it was shocking to me because, I mean, I guess any creative goes through this. When you look back at your film as you're, or as you're working on it, you see nothing but flaws and failure and things you wished you'd done differently. Um, and it wasn't until the second night of the screening uh, where we had a guest who came. His name was uh, Sergeant Justin Bond. He was a... Uh, army vet from, uh, uh, who had been in uh, the fight in Fallujah and uh, lost his leg in it. And he and I were having a great chat before the film and we sat next to each other through the screening of the film. And it was amazing to experience it that way because sitting next to this guy who's truly lived the story I made a film about. And there were moments where I got a little chuckle for him every now and then he'd whisper some little snide remark in my ear but also you could feel his emotions going through. And so I almost got to experience it fresh through him, uh, being able to kind of see it how he was seeing it for the first time. And that was the first time I ever got to actually experience my, my own film and enjoy it. Um, it was I'm very grateful for that experience, for, uh, for being able to see it through his eyes in a way in terms of just having his reactions right next to me while he was seeing it and being like, oh, oh, that did work, okay. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, it wasn't really until the second day of our theatrical premiere that I felt like, okay, this film's actually decent and it's gonna go somewhere. Um, and then it was a few, few weeks later back in New York, a gentleman who was a army psychologist in Afghanistan was back giving a talk to a handful of doctors in New York about PTSD and he invited me to it and literally told the doctors uh, at this meeting when he ended it, he's, he would reference the film a few times and even had a clip from it that he showed. But he said, if you want to understand what our vets go through when they come back home, watch this gentleman's film and pointed to me. And so afterwards, you know, talked with a few of the doctors, told them where they could watch it, stuff like that. Um, so it was moments like that where it really was like, okay, this, this was actually, it's a small indie film, but it was something special. It really just, the people that it was intended to hit, it really hit. 
I find that interesting, though, because you, you said before, I think, in another interview, that anything that could have been said about your film or maybe other films, you've maybe said worse about your oh, own yeah. work. And I'm wondering if that almost makes someone better. That um, I hope all the self-abuse isn't just <laughs> just a waste of time. Um, it, uh, it is. I mean, I try to always look for the positive in what I'm doing. Obviously, it's what keeps me going. But yeah, the self-criticism, I really, I mean, I've gotten some bad reviews in the past and every single one of them I'm like, oh yeah, I can see that, that makes sense. <laughs> you know, uh, the only one that I didn't get, and this was, it was an Amazon comment, was they, they said they hated this, the music in Frey. I'm like, there's no score. <laughs> <laughs> What are you talking about? Had to, there, there had to be some troll. Yeah, they had yeah. to find yeah. <laughs> That was the only one I've ever disagreed with. But, um, there was a comment on IMDb about Frey, and I thought it was interesting that you incorporated this part that you mentioned earlier about the self-reliance. And I think the commenter or the, the reviewer put um, that the main character in Frey, Justin, rejects anything he interprets as charity. Yeah. Did you pick up on that from meeting these vets? Uh, when you saw them? Definitely. In fact, there's a line in the short film. Uh, this uh, gentleman, uh, this older guy, offers him, uh, he's walking on the street, it's a rainy day, offers him a ride, and after he drops him off um, at uh, basically at the edge of the forest where the, uh, the character is sleeping, uh, he offers him, uh, he's like, I got some groceries in the back, and I gave you something like a beer or something. And there's a moment where... Uh, Justin, the veteran, uh, hesitates, and the guy says to him, it's not charity, it's thanks, and he takes it. And that was kind of the theme of that short film, was the idea of, like, you know, these things that we need to do to help our returning combat vets, it's not about charity, it's a thanks, it's for what, you know, what they've sacrificed. Um, and that was, to a lot of returning vets, again, it's that self-reliance, pride, um, they don't want charity they don't see themselves as a charity case and so um and you know it's not just with vets i mean you know i've i've seen it even in my own life as an artist i've had my ups and downs sometimes where uh you know you don't want to ask for help and but you need it and you know what that does to your psyche when you feel when you feel like a charity case and so um, really wanted to address that and kind of brought my own personal experiences with being down and out, um, having to sleep on somebody's sofa or not knowing how you're going to eat and having to ask a friend for $10 or whatever it might be. Um, try to bring that into it and just show that it's okay to be down and out sometimes. Like everybody has the potential to fall through the cracks. Um, it doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't mean that you failed. Uh, it just means that as as a society, we should help lift each other up. And so I kind of wanted to express that in the film the best I could within, within that story. There was actually, uh, I'd mentioned earlier when uh, Brian had spent some time with this home with uh, vets, he mentioned that there was a construction site across the street. And at one point, somebody just a big two by four, or some, something had fallen and clapped against some other wood. And he said it was fascinating for him to observe the reaction of the vets there versus his own. Like to him, it was like, oh, what was that? To them, it was just like on guard, like um, just immediate response. Even Vietnam vets, guys have been back for 35, 40 years, 50, terrible of math, however long it's been, you know, older gentlemen who had been back a long time, it was still that, that loud sound out of nowhere just set them on guard. And mm. uh, so, yeah, yeah, the fireworks are not good for, for that at all. No, and there were a lot of them this year. Yeah. Uh, how has your directing style evolved from your first film to now? Uh, thankfully, it's evolved from my first film. <laughs> uh, early on, I really was much more focused on uh, story and theme, oftentimes at the expense of uh, the uh, really the film experience. Uh, and over time and just through just repetition of trying, you know, of uh, shooting constantly, learning more about it. Um, to me, it's much more now about the psychology and the visceral experience. Um, you know, still enjoy some good dialogue, uh, that sort of thing, but really it's 
to me, it's not about what's said as much as about what is experienced by the audience. And that was the biggest change for me um, conceptually, which has really changed the way that I approach directing now. Um, one of the biggest things for me has been getting to a point where I trust my actors to know the character as well, if not better than I do. So that way the choices they make on screen are natural to them, that it's not me telling them to do this, it's them deciding that's what the character needed to do. Um, this is what the character would have done in that moment. Uh, same thing with uh, really almost any department on a film. Uh, I want whoever is there, I want them to feel empowered that they're there because they know exactly what this film needs for that moment. Um, there's been times where that hasn't worked. I've had to step in and take a more dict uh, dictator type approach. Um, but most of the time, um, I really like having that sort of environment on set where everybody feels like they are an active contributor to the creative output of the film, to what it's actually saying. Um, but again, especially with actors, I think it's just so key that they feel comfortable and that they're not being judged, that they're not, you know, I don't ever want them to feel like they made the wrong choice. I'll say something like, instead of saying, oh, no, don't do it that way, do it this way. Instead, I'll say, that was great, but how about if we try it this way? Um, that was really good, but let's just try maybe a little bit more, uh, a little bit more anger or a little bit more sarcasm or something like that and try to find those ways to where they always, they never feel like they did it wrong. And Vanya, the lead in Blood from Stone, he started joking with me about it whenever I said he did it great. He's like, you mean I sucked? I'm like, no, he didn't <laughs> suck. <laughs> um, so he caught on to some of my tricks. Uh, but it really is, it's, it's, uh, because it isn't necessarily a wrong choice. There is no wrong choice. Uh, it's all about, you know, knowing how to get it to where I want it to go. And honestly, one of the greatest things for me as a director is all the work I've done as an editor um, and as a DP. Uh, I really, I didn't set out to do either of those. Um, I just did them out of necessity because I had no budgets. Uh, and so, you know, you got, I just had to figure it out myself. Um, but doing that, especially like, you know, doing interviews for clients, you know, we do an hour long interview and I have to edit it into a one minute video. Um, all that type of stuff over the years has helped me when I'm directing, when I'm watching a scene, I can see it and edit it in my mind and know we got that line, we got that line. Oh no, we didn't get that line. Okay, that one was decent. And then I can kind of just keep that organized in my brain so that I don't yell, you know, or I don't say that, you know, to move on to the next, scene or the next part until I know we've gotten all the takes we need for it to come together in editing. Um, and that's been a huge, huge help because early on, I was just never sure if we had it. I'm like, I think we do. And then I get into editing and I'm like, oh, no, no, we didn't get it. <laughs> uh, so that's been a huge help too, is just finding, you know, finding those great moments and being able to file it away in my brain, like seeing the edit as it's happening. and. Even to a certain extent, my screenwriting, I mean, I write an edited film. I mean, this uh, fray and this one, the, the scene count is obscene because it's a lot of back and forth between scenes. Um, so it, literally my script is almost verbatim what you see on camera uh, with the exception of some improv by the actors. But uh, scene organization, uh, just everything flows exactly as it is in the final film. There's only uh, one one scene that got cut and one that or two that got shortened a little bit. Jeff, can we talk about the budget for Frey? I understand you financed it through various jobs. Yeah, yeah. So um, I was I was kind of fortunate after I did the short film, the little experiment for Frey. Um, we literally wrapped that on the day that the housing market uh, and Lehman uh, collapsed, <laughs> um, wow. which is a terrible time to just spend your meager savings on a film and then not have a job for six months. Um, and so, but I was kind of fortunate in a way that after those six months when companies started hiring again, they weren't, they didn't have the budgets to go with the big ad agencies. And I had a couple of my fashion clients that were like, well, this Jeff guy that's been doing our, uh, you know, internals and our in-store videos, his stuff's basically as good as the agencies we hire. Let's just have him do our commercials. 
And so I kind of got really lucky, um, started landing a couple of, you know, I mean, they were hiring me at much less than what they would hire for a big production company or an agency. But for me, it was a lot. <laughs> and so um, I was able to put away some savings uh, over the course of about two years and um, was able to pull it off. And then also just lucky, I mean, I wrote it with Brian in mind. He and I had done the short film and we'd known each other a while, knowing you know that I had Jaron as my cinematographer on it to, uh, you know, obviously is one of the best cinematographers of this generation. We did, you know, I've always felt that way. Fortunately, he's kind of gotten there now. Um, having Jody as the producer, um, you know, had a great circle of friends that brought it to life. And then shooting in Oregon was a huge help too. Um, you know, it was, uh, a lot of people there, one, they believed in the story. Um, they really believed in what we were trying to do with it. So we got, um, you know, uh, we got people, all the, all the cars for the film were donated to us. Uh, all the locations, with the exception of two, we got for free. We got the wood mill for free. We just had to have insurance. Um, you know, just so much we were able to get, and people were so helpful with it. Uh, the employment agency scene, actually, when we were talking to the woman who owned that actual employment agency, she said that if we needed extras, she would reach out to her network of uh, people who were looking for work. Um, so that's how we were able to get so many extras for the film. Uh, it was just, um, yeah, so in terms of like pulling it off for a smaller budget, it was, um, it just took a lot of favors. Uh, but, um, you know, like I said, because I had that commercial world, you know, was, our budget on that was probably the craft services budget for like an A24 film. <laughs> um, but it was still enough that we were able to pull off something with all those, all those other people really putting their heart and soul into it. And one of my proudest things about that was so many of the local people that worked on it, it did end up elevating their careers. Some of them was their first film they'd ever worked on. And you know, I wrote everybody a letter of rec recommendation for whatever they wanted to do because I'm like, if you worked on this film, you had your hands in every department. <laughs> so, um, I mean, there were, there were entire days where it was literally myself, Jaron, uh, Brian, another, whoever the other actor was, and Matt, who was a PA. Like, that was the entirety of our production. It was just, you know, it was three people and, some, and two actors or three actors at a time for days on end. So it was, a, you know, everybody on it just put in so much. And so they, a lot of their careers got elevated by it, which was so great to see because We've all worked on no budget films that when we're done with like, well, that was a waste of three days or five days or whatever. So knowing that the people that came on board were able to go on and do more afterwards um, and were elevated by this film was just something I was really proud of as well because uh, it's a hard industry. So being able to help lift others up is, is a good feeling. So you knew how much you had in this bank account or bank accounts or whatever. When, when you started to dip past a certain point yeah. and, and maybe the clock was ticking, what was your mindset? <laughs> uh, um, I, when, when the funds were running low, it was, uh, it was nerve wracking. Had to compartmentalize because the, the anxiety meltdown that was happening, you just put that in this box over here. And this box over here is like, well, if you don't finish the film, then you just ruined your life for nothing. <laughs> So, um, it was, and on, we actually had, we took a three-day hiatus because I had a client that wanted me to do a commercial, a uh, little uh, web commercial, and it was like, yeah, we'll put it on hiatus. I what, literally took the last of the money I had and gave it to Jaron, who was stuck in Portland for three days um, while I was away, and, uh, you know, basically went back to New York, did a shoot, then flew right back. Um, I didn't get paid for it for another month, but at least had that coming in. And then really grateful, uh, Marissa, the lead actress in it, her parents gave, uh, I should remember this, I think it was $2,000 to us to help out. Um, my own parents threw in a uh, $1,000 um, and helped cover some of the hotel costs <laughs> for us. So, you know, it was fortunate, like family and friends really pitched in. Uh, my girlfriend at the time, Kim, she set up a PayPal account where people could make donations. That helped bring a couple hundred more dollars in. Um, just 
really just crawled across the finish line. And, uh, and then when, I, when we wrapped, you know, got back to New York and just took like the next three months just doing as much client work as I could because um, I wasn't going to have a home for much longer if I didn't. And uh, I didn't want art to, uh, or life to imitate art that much. So. so it sounds like it was kind of rah rah out of the gate and then fin piecemeal at the end. And, it was. And that's kind of how you finished it. Yeah, it was. I mean, definitely we knew. I mean, the budget was so small. And I guess at this point I can say, I mean, we literally went into this shoot with just over $20,000. Um, obviously, we spent a lot more over the course of the film, but that was what we were starting with on it. And. Uh, that's not a lot. <laughs> uh, that doesn't stretch very far when you're trying to, f when you got to fly some cast and crew out to New York and house them and feed them, or out from New York to Oregon, house and feed them, transportation, all the logistical costs. And, uh, you know, it was just some other checks would come in from projects I'd done a few months before, or add that to the budget. Um, and again, my girlfriend at the time, Kim, she was managing. Uh, managing all the finances. She would watch my bank account and tell me where I was at. And she'd be like, you guys need to spend less money on coffee. I'm like, I can't. <laughs> um, that's, that's not a compromise we can make. <laughs> right. Especially not in Oregon. No, they oh, have, the coffee's are, so are good. Are they comparable to, yeah, Seattle? Yeah, yeah. Um, there was a place uh, that we were just hooked on and Brian still talks about to this day. He's like, I just, I want to go back for their coffee. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was intense, that's for sure. Uh, every dollar on that one mattered. I mean, all the wardrobe that we bought came from Goodwill. Uh, you know, again, and just every favor we could get was uh, was a uh, was just an essential. I mean, if we hadn't gotten all the favors we had gotten, there's no way that film would have happened. So. And sorry, you shot right before the actual quote unquote meltdown, the, the Lehman oh, Brothers? That, that was the or? short film, uh, Poor, the one that I did as an experiment oh. for Frey. Uh, so that was right before that meltdown. So I guess I was ahead of the curve in terms of talking about, uh, you know, just financial precarity. Uh, and obviously it inspired the script uh, in this one, you know, thus why Marissa's character is a teacher of uh, uh, morals and uh, economics. Um, uh, I forget the specific term, which is terrible, but uh, but yeah, so you know, wedge that in there in terms of as a way to discuss some of those higher ideas without being too heavy-handed. I hope, um, but yeah, it was definitely heavily inspired by that because you know it just it's so easy to fall through the cracks. As an artist, I've seen it. You know, as a freelancer and an artist, you know, it's feast or famine. Sometimes things are great, and then you know, buy a new set of lenses and then you don't get a job for six months. You're like, oh God, that was a stupid choice. Um, and so, you know, I know how easy it is. And granted, for me, a lot of those financial decisions are not essentials. A set of lenses isn't an essential. It's a good business investment. I mean, I've used the same set of lenses now for six, seven years and they're gorgeous. Um, uh, same with camera, you know, drop 20, 30 grand on a camera. That's a lot of money. That's you know, it's a new car, for a nice new car and all that, but that pays itself back over time. Yet those are still expenses that are huge. And, you know, you hit a dry spell with work and you're just like, oh God, I'm not gonna be able to make rent now. So those are all things that I took from my experiences over the years and try to work into it and make it feel authentic. You know, I, I can see how somebody could easily just tire of the rat race and just that constant trying to keep your head above water and just step out. Like, I'm just, I'm gonna go live in the woods. Uh, I'm gonna go sleep under a bridge. I'm not gonna stress it. Uh, there was actually, there was even a homeless gentleman who used to sleep in my subway station that every now and then I'd come home with a bottle of wine or a bottle of whiskey or something like that and we'd sit on the bench on the subway platform and just chat. And he was that way. Uh, he said he just got tired of trying to survive. He goes, he's like, this isn't an easy life, but at least I don't have the I don't have the worries that I had. And so wanted to bring that to it is just that idea of the struggle, just the day-to-day -day struggle that so many people face and don't have a way out of. I feel so fortunate that as a filmmaker that I can go and do a commercial and live off of that for a month or two or three months um, 
and then go back to my writing and my editing and stuff like that. Like that's such a luxury to be able to have that, that most people don't have that ability to get that magical check. That's what the lottery's you know, so popular for. Um, and so, yeah, it's, I just wanted to try and express that in a, in a film and show, show to people who may be a little bit more fortunate that it's really easy for people to, to lose their grip and give up hope. We have a quote here from Variety about your new film, Blood from Stone, a genre-defying vampire film. Yes. But why hasn't this been done before? That's a good question. Um, it was, I, this idea had been fermenting in the back of my head to do kind of a wacky vampire film, but, you know, we hit the uh, True Blood and Twilight years where just vampires were everywhere. And then you have films like What We Do in the Shadows that are just, I mean, perfect vampire sat satires. It's like, okay, I can't, there's nothing I can do in that realm that's going to top that film or even be of any value anymore. Um, then there's films like uh, Let the Right One In that are just gorgeous, beautiful, coming-of-age art films that also deal with ideas of immortality. So it was definitely one of those things that we just kept on the back burner because I'm like, I have nothing of value to bring to this genre. Um, or to the vampire films. And then just personal experience, uh, lost a grandfather and reflecting on that it was, for me it was this idea of this man who was from another era who, good person in his heart um, and a good grandfather but also somebody that after John Wayne stopped making movies and uh, you know cultural and social changes happened with uh, you know, us white guys not having all the power anymore. Um, it wasn't his era anymore. And he didn't like where the world was going. He didn't feel like he belonged here anymore. And kind of just gave up on life, but didn't die for 25 years. <laughs> um, and so I grew up with his grandfather who just really wasn't happy with the world, uh, wasn't happy with still being a part of it. And uh, started thinking like that's kind of a fascinating angle on it is this idea of an immortal. Somebody who's been here 200 years, he comes from the days when he could, or 400 years where he could ransack a village and you know, what do you do? Uh, you blame it on angry gods and you, you uh, move on with your life. Um, what would he do in this new era where attitudes have changed, technology has changed and um, that's why I've jokingly called it uh, Leaving Las Vegas Meets Natural Born Killers because it's almost, there's some parallels to the Nicolas Cage character in uh, Leaving Las Vegas, this guy that's just, he's done, he's out. Um, he's just trying to numb himself to it all um, and speed up his exit. Um, so it deals with those sorts of ideas and really using the vampire idea as a way to explore some deeper themes while it's still being entertaining. Uh, you know, one of my favorite films is Samsara, which is kind of about the cyclical nature of existence and the rise and fall of civilizations and trying to escape this cycle, this perpetual cycle of rise and fall and creation and destruction that we're on. Um, beautiful film, uh, but not exactly a, uh, you know, typical crowd pleaser. And so trying to take themes like that, but do it through the vampire idea of old eras and new eras. Uh, creation, destruction, um, and the cyclical nature of things to for characters that have seen those cycles, that have seen a few of them, and, and it's all kind of repetition to them, whereas to us, the daily news is catastrophic. To them, they've seen it all and done it all. Um, and so kind of exploring those ideas, and that's where even ideas like I brought in a lot of iconography and tropes of westerns, of noir films, uh, films that are thought of as from another era and showing them in this more modern kind of indie context where it's gritty and a little rougher uh, and just contrasting that the music score of being a blend of synthesizers and rootsy banjo and lap steel uh, and just showing like these clashing you know, different eras and different genres into this fight between the old and the new that we see so much of in our current political and social environment. So that's where I think that genre defined comes from is that it's not a horror film in the truest sense. It's not uh, 
just, you know, it's not a romance, it's not a Western, it's not a noir, it's kind of all of those in one. Um, at least that was the hope, and I've been saying since day one there was a good chance this film could be a total train wreck because it's just trying to do a lot of things at once. But so far from initial reactions, it seems to have worked. <laughs> it seems that people are enjoying it. I love the night shoots especially. You had these great shots where maybe the scene itself was about something very, uh, you know, violent, but a beautiful desert background with a moon and a cactus. And I just wondered, how did you pull that off and what kind of lighting did you use? <laughs> that was the magic of very recent technologies. Uh, that was the Sony A7S III. S. I think that was the model. I'm so bad with the name, the number letter combos, uh, which is, you know, small DSLR camera that low light capabilities are ridiculous. Um, I was so nervous when I wrote it. I'm like, how am I going to do desert exteriors with no budget? We can't light a desert. I um, was trying to think of how we could pull that off. And then that camera came out and I did some tests with it. And it was like, holy crap, I can see a horizon line in the desert at night. <laughs> um, and so got a PL mount for it, uh, put some high speed primes on it. And we shot all the car interiors uh, with the, infam or the, the crazy uh, ride share scene. That was all shot on that thing. Um, all the desert night exteriors were shot with it. And literally no lighting, um, just the moon, headlights from the car in one of the shots, or in, actually two of them. Um, and then the glow of the city from in the distance, that was our lighting. It was literally just natural light uh, to be able to pull off night exteriors. And then using some uh, neat videos, uh, denoiser and post to get rid of the obscene amount of grain in it to pull off that kind of lo level of low light. Um, and yeah, it, uh, it looks awesome. <laughs> I was like pleasantly Beautiful. surprised with how well those night exteriors turned out. I thought they were gonna be just a grainy, nasty, muddy mess, but I love how they look. Yeah, they're beautiful. And this is just a small thing, but I noticed three characters wore robes. Yes. When, and it was, what was the significance of that? It was almost like the 30, there was these beautiful, even the one that he wears is sort of, sort of more thrift shop style, but it, yeah. there was a very cool sort of theme of these robes. Thanks, yeah, it was, uh, the robe, his robe in it was, uh, was intended, and it was really hard to find a, a, a floral, a uh, really well used robe that fit Vanya. But uh, we were able, to, it was scripted as, basically the idea is he's supposed to be kind of a squatter in this home. It's obviously not his home from the decorations to that sort of thing. Uh, and so that was the idea there. And then with, uh, with the other two, it just kind of, to me it was, show, it's like a, Basically, it's a way to kind of showcase the characters in their distinct personalities, but also they're the, like, they're the only three vampires. So it was kind of just, it was almost like a uniform in a way for them, like their comfort level. Um, that was, although on a deeper level, there really wasn't anything to the robes. It was just kind of, I wanted to show them in their environment at their most like comfortable, natural, sort of relaxed state. Uh, but it didn't have like a deeper theme, so. Maybe there'll be something audiences pull from it. I always, I'm always, in, always enjoy that when someone says something, I'm like, oh, I wish I'd thought of that. I'm gonna use that. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was really smart, um, but not with the robes. And then the convention goers at the bar and sort yes. of this attitude of that they almost didn't have to behave because they were out of their element. Yeah. I guess living in LA, we see that with a lot of tourists sometimes, yeah. you know, especially if you're in Santa Monica or wherever, you can see sort of the, the people that forget that they have to still engage yes. among society and they, and they, you know, it's like a big fun, you know, thing. And I thought that was interesting how you showed very subtle things of these men at this convention. And yeah. I don't know if you've ever worked a convention or something, maybe. I've, I worked in, uh, I was a waiter for long enough and did enough uh, catering and stuff like that. I've worked some events like that. And to me it was, so the, the three main male characters, and I don't want to give away too many spoilers here, but the three main male characters, you have Vanya, who's just, I mean, the guy looks like Jason Momoa, um, just a giant beast of a man. Um, and then you have the Mike character who's the convention goer and then the Raymond character, the doctor. And 
to me, like the Raymond one and the Vanya and Vanya's character Yure, they're like the um, sort of like dual ends of male archetypes. You have Vanya, the super alpha male, who is all in it for himself, and then the Raymond character, who is the much softer, more social creature, who's intro introverted and finds his value and how he can be of benefit to others. Instead of Vanya is all about how what he can acquire for himself. And with uh, the Mike character, the convention goer, he was to me the, the guy who by nature should be more of a Raymond, <laughs> but due to social conditioning and the idea of wanting to be the alpha macho cool guy, he's trying to be more of the, the Yure character, the, the, the cool guy that is suave and handsome and funny and all that, and he fails miserably at it. And so it was kind of... Um, so maybe an overused term now, but it was kind of showcasing like the effects of that that m messaging of masculinity and how it's shown in media and what a guy is supposed to be and sort of showing how that can become so just ugly. Um, you know, it's like kind of just be true to who you are. Uh, I've always you know, joked that I've never had troubles with uh, anyone that questions my own masculinity because I don't have it. <laughs> it's like I just I am who I am and I never wanted to be that alpha guy and so I kind of wanted to show you know but you see that in others like when you're trying to be someone you're not you become a very toxic person and so like just embrace who you are so that was kind of that idea of those convention goers like when they're in that element it's like he's his character when he's just talking to Daria he's actually a sweet nice guy when he's with his convention buddies, he has to act like he's the cool alpha dude. And so you see that sort of toxic, ugly side of him come out. So that was kind of the idea with exploring it in that vein. And then anyone that's been to, you know, the casinos and stuff knows that the conventions are, you know, I mean, that's half their income, I, I would imagine, is at least from maybe not the gambling, but definitely from the hotels and stuff like that, is trying to get conventions there. And so anytime you're at a casino, there's going to be a convention there. So just kind of part of the, Part of the casino life. <laughs> yeah, I thought it. And then set against the the people gambling, the sort of sad yeah. desperation of this jackpot's going to do it. You know, this this last one. You know? Exactly, and same with in the convention. It's all about the sale. You know, even when he's sitting there with them, they're talking about acquiring the woman and acquiring the sale. That's literally the the two themes that they they talk about. Is uh, you know. And, out in the casinos, it's all these people throwing their funds into their hoping they get that jackpot and just, you know, kind of, kind of the idea and uh, it was actually our uh, guy that helped with the stunts in it, Carl, he uh, uh, came on, he's a uh, wonderful guy and he said uh, to him it was fascinating when he were there, he goes, you almost feel like the vampires are more alive than the actual living people. Uh, and that was kind of the idea of it is just showing like this this constant hunt for some life-sustaining, you know, whether it's the, the the money from a jackpot, the sale, all of that, like this is like almost like a vampire culture that has, uh, you know, kind of become our our uh, commercial society. Jeff, we found this quote from you. I think you said, "I wanted to create something that people will walk away from thinking I've never seen anything like that before." A small indie like this can't compete with Hollywood for spectacle and star power, but we can try to make much more interesting films at least. Can you expand on that? Yeah, um, yeah, I definitely wanted to, wanted to make something that, yeah, that when people walked away from, they didn't just forget about it. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I, I forget, I should remember, I, I want to say it was Kubrick, but they, they, some, a director I remember reading years ago said, um, I don't care if they love it or hate it, I want them to remember it. And that to me, that's, I have more respect and I enjoy watching films that go for the gusto and fail over those that just try to appeal to the most common denominator. It's why I'm not a big fan of superhero movies, but I appreciate the DC ones a hundred times over the Marvel ones because DC made some steamers, but they're always like, they always try to do something 
that's really over the top and interesting or whatever. And whereas Marvel, like they all kind of bleed together. It's and there's no consequences and you get into that. But even just in the indie film world, how do you compete with those movies? I mean, they've got they spend more on uh, you know I'm sure their Xerox budget than I had for this whole film. Um, just to, and so. You know, I'm not going to allow do them in action or spectacle and uh, star power, <laughs> but I can at least try and um, I can at least try and give the audience something that they're going to walk away feeling like I got a unique experience from this. And so, with that, like the intent was not necessarily to make something. That the hard part about doing that is you don't want to make something that's uh, too. Um, can't think of the word right now. You don't want to make it where it's too abstract or like audiences aren't going to feel like like it's worth committing to it. Um, still make it entertaining. Still make it fun. You know, it's uh, I try to keep it fast paced. It's a little bit of a slow burn. Like it has a slow build, but once it kicks in, it's I try to give it a good pace. Um, there's a lot of just there is some spectacle in it, at least for a small indie. Uh, but then thematically, um, I don't like I don't like things that fit into a neat little box. So uh, musicians I like often are, do a lot of fusion type of stuff. They mix different genres, um, and same with filmmakers. Uh, you know, some of the films that inspired me when I was first kind of getting my start in the night. You know, as a teenager in the '90s, you know, watching. Tarantino stuff, which is often unclassifiable for a genre. Um, watching, you know, uh, movies like California. Like, I guess it's a thriller, but it's also it's funny. I mean, I still quote that movie. Bl Brad Pitt's my arguably my favorite role next to his mo his role in True Romance, um, which is another one. Uh, Natural Born Killers. Uh, s some of these films that go dark and they're. All, like they kind of challenge your own morality as an audience, but at the same time they're funny. They have characters that you fall in love with, uh, even though they're horrible, <laughs> and uh, um, and just you know deal with deeper human themes and social and political themes. So I kind of fell in love with movies like that, and I feel like we have an industry that needs to sell things, and so they need to know how to sell it, and so it needs to be a certain product, and. That in a way has really homogenized so much of storytelling, and in my own little way, I wanted to try and like break out of that, and not not think about oh well, this is a horror movie, so I can't do this, or if I do this, um, you know, fans of the vampire genre are going to be like, well, this isn't a real vampire movie, um, and more just let the let the story go where it needs to go to be the story it needs to be, uh, without worrying about. Making it marketable um, now. Unfortunately for my distributors, makes their job a lot harder. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned the movie California from was that 1993. Yeah, was it okay? Because the bartender in your film, the opening scenes reminded me of Juliette Lewis. Yeah. She had a very similar sort of not just look, but a, the sort of the character type as well. Yeah, you know what? And uh, we. That Juliet Lewis character, and Juliet Lewis in any movie is one of my favorites. Uh, she's just phenomenal. But in that one, she is, she's just, I mean, phenomenal. So, both adorable and trashy, and um, and I just, I absolutely love her in that movie as well. And so, I'm sure, on some level, like just stylistically, those movies definitely impacted. Uh, you know, on Blood from Stone, I was the uh, this wardrobe and stylist person as well. So, um, you know, basically every article in clothing you see in that I not only found and purchased or at the very least uh, agreed to. But um, yeah, so I'm sure my own styling of the movie was probably heavily inspired by by that film. And that goes back to what you said too about not everybody wants these like films that are in a neat little box, these popcorn yeah. movies. Some people want the the Juliet Lewis. Totally. Protagonist and and can relate to that more than and nothing against Sandra Bullock, but her characters I admire Sandra's career, yeah. but her characters are always sort of very similar and sort of this like savior you know middle class I'm gonna fix yeah. everything and not all of us can totally relate to that and again nothing against it but I think it, it has to be something 
a little I, there is a damaged quality to some of Juliet's roles and I, yeah. I, I like that. Well, yeah, Juliet Lewis always brings such a vulnerability even in Natural Born Killers. I mean, she's ferocious in that and yet, you know, the flashbacks to her childhood, the, the hostile relationships that she has with Woody Harrelson's character, um, you can understand where her anger is coming from. Like it's never, even when she's a monster, to, she plays it in a way where you still feel some sense of sympathy for her or at the very least empathy. Like you like, I understand why she's acting that way. And that to me, I mean, that's a, that's a great villain. And I also, about those movies, I mean, the villain was the main characters in those movies. Um, you know, kind of anti-heroes, if you want to call them that. Uh, and, you know, there's got to be something redeeming. There was a great quote that said, uh, even the devil's convinced himself he's doing the right thing. So, you know, with any of these, you know, villain characters or anti-heroes, if you don't feel like you can understand why they're doing it, then it's not a good character. And Juliet Lewis is phenomenal at portraying that. Did your distributor, Indie Rights, give you the idea for a vampire movie, or is that something that you came up with and pitched it to them? So, um, I would say I met, you know, met Michael Linda through Frey, and Indie Rights was just phenomenal for that film. Uh, and as anybody that's ever gone through distribution knows, it's a nightmare process when you find a good distributor, cling to him. <laughs> and uh, um, they've become good friends. And we were at dinner one night, and I was uh, talking with them, and. I had recently come across a notepad that had this kind of some notes of this film, so I was telling them about about it, just the uh, initial ideas for it. And the next day, Michael texted me and basically said, "This should be your next film. This is something that could actually sell." Um, and so I started thinking. I was like, "Well, you know, Frey was great, and I mean, I'm fortunate it actually made its budget back and turned mildly profitable off of you know fairly modest budget, but." It, a film I never expected to make a dime off of. Um, but if I want to actually have a f career making films, I should probably do one that has the potential to make money. Um, you know, and so, uh, so yeah, I've decided uh, if I could find a way to make it work for me that this would be the film to do. And that's when really reflecting on it and finding, you know, and it was literally right around the time that, you know, the story I said earlier about my grandfather passing happened that I started thinking about it from that perspective. I'm like, okay, this could actually be really interesting. Um, you know, just feeling into something that's like, you know, drinks to numb the pain, is done with their life, but isn't, you know, can't die. Um, and then on the, the female side of it, um, it almost sounds terrible, I'm bringing up family as inspirations for my vampire movie. Um, they're lovely people. <laughs> <laughs> But my mother had said to me years ago, uh, when she was growing up, she was, you know, in the 60s, being raised to be like, you know, a good housewife. If she had aspirations, it was to be a teacher or a secretary. Um, and then, you know, late 60s, uh, women's rights and uh, really started to flourish. And she's like, when I went off to college, all of a sudden I'm being told I can be anything I want to be. And like, I'd never thought of that before. Who, I don't even know who I want to be. And she's a, I could go on forever. She's an amazingly talented and smart woman who just, it took really until later on in life before she found the things she's really passionate about. Um, and by that time it was like, well, I can't really make this my career. I'm in my, you know, late fifties or sixties. So, um, you know, it was kind of the idea of like, exploring that, a woman who's from that type of, whether culture or an era, where the, they were really a commodity that if they wanted to be something, it was to be a housewife and a, kind of a servant class. Um, how does someone like that navigate and find her own agency in this current climate where women are finally allowed to have a voice, finally allowed to make those decisions that can guide their life and whether those decisions are right or wrong. I mean, the character in the script makes some dumb decisions, <laughs> um, some decisions that she regrets. Uh, but she had the, f the agency and the freedom to make those choices, and that's part of her 
coming of her own, you know, into her own, and coming out of this uh, this sort of uh, place where she'd been under Yure or been a, you know, villager, and being able to kind of find that, navigate that, but then also learning from the examples around her. You know, her her colleague and friend is another, you know, cocktail waitress who maybe isn't the best example of how to, you know, make the right decisions in your life. And so kind of explores that idea. And uh, Gabriella, who plays Daria, was just such a, a perfect discovery for somebody to really encapsulate that persona uh, authentically. She was excellent. Is she Eastern European? Because she had a beautiful accent, but she- I looked at her bio, it didn't say. Yeah, she's actually Hungarian. Uh, she grew oh, okay. up in Hungary, and she's been in the U.S. for a while now, but uh, it was actually coincidentally, I didn't know this until after I'd cast her, I was telling her about some of the inspirations for when I was writing The Family. I based it loosely off the uh, uh, Elizabeth Bathory and her family. Uh, she's like infamous, uh, often believed to have been a real vampire, um, and found out that Gabriella actually grew up about approximately 10 miles from their castle. <laughs> so oh, wow. probably, you know, sure ancestors of hers had been, uh, you know, sacrifices to the Bathories back in the day. So, or at least had known them. So it's, uh, I think she, she brought a lot of that heritage, that really authentic heritage to the character. Um, and also, you know, coming from a country that politically and socially is very different than ours, um, you know, something I always thought about with my grandmother, who was, uh, she was also from Eastern Europe. And even, you know, all these, all those years later, still like a very reserved woman, a very thoughtful, strong woman, but very reserved in her ways. Like almost, I mean, uh, almost that old idea of knowing a woman's place. Like she was very much of that. And for someone coming from a different culture where that is still a thing, um, that a woman has a place, um, having that in this character, having that be something that she's actively trying to grow beyond, but still struggling with that, you know, I think Gabby's had this naturalness with that because she's coming from a place that kind of still has some of those old world social structures and philosophies. Yeah, I thought she played the part extremely well, and you'd also see it in her eyes. She'd be processing something, but wouldn't necessarily say it. So you could tell, okay, she'll she'll play the role, but she's got another trick up her sleeve, and and yeah, I, I like that too. I thought that was really that, well done. That was a huge challenge for her, and something I knew early on was going to be a, a difficult thing for anyone that played that role. Is throughout the entire film, there's only two scenes where you see her authentic self, or three scenes, I should say, uh, where you see her authentic self. For most of the movie, her overt emotions are a cover for what the character is actually feeling. And so she really had to play that well. And um, a few of the people have seen it, the film more than once have said it's interesting to watch it that second time where you can really see how she does, you know, ride that line of like showing, acting the emotions that her character is supposed to be acting, but also showing what the character is really feeling. And like you said, so much of it is through just her incredibly subtle uh, mannerisms, her eyes. Um, she's a very gifted actress. Absolutely, and I, I noticed she she should have more credits. I hope she gets more work. I, I looked at her yeah. IMDb, and I really hope she gets more roles because she's extremely yeah. talented. We were actually nervous about that with both her and uh, Vanya for leads in a film. Uh, Nika, who was so helpful in the film as well as a supporting role. Yeah. Uh, she and I had some talks about that uh, in terms of like, are we really entrusting this film to some actors that don't have a lot of credits? I mean, Vanya had the theater background at least. Um, but you'd watch the tapes and you're just like, I just, I believe them so much. And, uh, you know, really gr- glad I took that, uh, you know, had that faith in them and that they had the faith in me to, you know, go off to Vegas for a month into this crazy shoot. Um, but yeah, I got really fortunate with them. They're both uh, just phenomenal talents. And I too really hope to see them in a lot more. I was joking. I hope by the time we do the sequel to this, I can't afford them. <laughs> <laughs> we have a quote here from your executive producer and distributor, Michael Madison. Okay. 
and he's of indie rights. And he put Jeff Ryan proved that he could deliver the highest quality production value and dramatic flair on a budget that makes profitability much more attainable than more directors can deliver. So your first your first feature, Frey, reached what the top fifteen in Amazon war films? Yeah, yeah. War and military. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Frey reached. Uh, it, reached the top 15 war and military films in Amazon the US and it got to number two under art house independent films in the UK. Um, they apparently don't have a war and military section so they put it under indie art house. But uh, it was wild. I mean, I just never expected that. I mean, we were literally right below, I have a screenshot of it, we were right below Apocalypse Now. I'm like, if we, if I go above Apocalypse Now on Amazon, I'm just going to retire. I'm never going to top that. <laughs> <laughs> just go out while you're ahead. Um, but it was wild. I mean, to see our little film up do it, performing better than, you know, on Amazon, performing better than uh, Hurt Locker, performing better than, you know, Platoon, these films that were just, to me, iconic uh, and great films uh, in, in their own right. Uh, and I mean, the UK one also have screen grabbed because it was just surreal to see. It was literally the only film above it was Reservoir Dogs, um, oh, wow. which is just wild to see. Uh, so yeah, and again, I mean, we did that film for so little. Um, you know, there's a lot of expenses to the film that add up. I mean, the festival circuit, marketing, promotion, sound mastering, I spent a fortune on, cause on Frey, I was also I was the director sound man. Um, and I'm not a great sound man, so a lot of, post budget on uh, refining the sound quality and stuff like that. Um, but uh, but yeah, it was great to see that happen. And so, you know, Linda and Michael, not only because of that, but they've seen what I've done with the commercial world. They've seen, you know, just the diversity of projects I can do that have been successful for clients. So they know that even though Frey is my only, was my only feature at the time, that I at least have the consistency of being able to deliver at a high production value for modest budgets. Um, and so, and again, I'm just, I'm fortunate. The fact that I fell into the world of doing like, you know, fashion web commercials and stuff where, you know, I, I wouldn't have the greatest budget for my end of it, but would make it work. And um, just got to constantly be shooting. I mean, they have a new season every three months. So there'd be a new ad every three months. And I was really fortunate, just constantly refining that skill set and then not having budgets, always having to get my own costumes, do my own set design. Um, but learning from these commercial shoots where I'm working with these, you know, professional production designers, professional costume designers and all that sort of stuff. And so I developed taste level for what you can accomplish with a budget, but then also um, try to apply that to my own productions where, you know, and I, I enjoy that stuff. I think that's part of having that fine arts background helps, um, where it's not about the medium, it's about the overall message. In the writing and development process, what kinds of questions were you asking yourself about the story, about the characters? Um, in my writing process, I actually, I have a weird process. I read this book, uh, called The Mind of the Maker by Dorothy L. Sayers, and it's a fascinating book. I recommend it anybody in the creative field. Um, she wrote it in the 19, uh, 1941, it came out, um, and she was a mystery writer, but she wrote this one. It was about, she was trying to write a book of theology, but in trying to explain the mind of, of a god, she uses artists and writers as an example, and it's a, one of the things I loved about it is she said that as a creator, you create the world, you create the physics of it and the laws of it, and you create the people that inhabit it, but then you give them free will. <laughs> and to me, that is the most organic form of writing. And so my writing process is I try to, I try to just see the world and try to understand it and know who my characters are and the premise. And then I literally just, I ferment on that for a while until I feel like I have an understanding, I'll write notes and stuff like that. And then I literally just sit down and write and just when it comes to a plot point, like what would they do here? What would they do here? And letting the character I've conjured in my mind have that free will to make those choices instead of me guiding them. And the only time I fin feel like I hit a writer's block now is when I'm trying to force them to do something they wouldn't do. <laughs> 
Um, and so that is kind of my writing process. And then once I have a first draft out, that's when I then go back and start asking myself those questions like, okay, here's some of the themes I wanted to address that maybe aren't as clear, aren't in it. How do I put that into it? How do I, is there a where, place where this works? Is there a place where this works? Um, and so I have a kind of a weird writing style I developed after reading that book. And it was, to me, it was a lifesaver because that's why Frey ended up being the film it is, was I after reading that, I changed my whole creative style and writing style based on what I'd read in there. And uh, um, it obviously worked with Frey. <laughs> uh, so I decided to keep doing it that way. And, um, you know, I think that's part of why Blood from Stone is so different as well is I don't set up a structure. I don't set up markers. I don't have any plot points I write down. It's like, here's the world. Here's the characters. Let's see where we go. And I... I actually like the process now. Um, I can, like, Frey I wrote in about three weeks, beginning to end, and the first draft and the final draft, there's a lot of editing, a lot of refining, but as a whole, they're very similar. And same with Blood from Stone. Uh, if you look at the first draft and the final draft, other than chopping a lot of pages off of it, it's a very similar story. Uh, so for better or for worse, the writing style that works for me, we'll see what audiences feel. <laughs> um, but I enjoy it. It comes out much more organically. I don't get writer's block. Um, it just takes a lot longer to write that first page because you're trying to figure out all the aspects of the world that they're in, all the people that are there. But once you have that all, just kind of let them loose in your brain and see what happens. That's how I do it, at least. How did you find that book or how did the book find you? It sounds like that sounds like a very magical book. I haven't oh, actually is. heard of it. It's yeah, it's, I found it. I, one of my obsessions is I collect old books, uh, not like collectible old books. I only have a few of those. Um, but just, I love going into antique stores, thrift stores, old bookstores and digging through for just ones that sound interesting. And I'm obsessed with reading about psychology. I'm obsessed with reading about religion and theology. Um, I'm obsessed with reading about other cultures um, and uh, anthropology and all that sort of stuff. And I just, I was going through one of those sections and there was a book called The Mind of the Maker. I'm like, well, that sounds fascinating. And I read just the first two pages of her, of Dorothy's uh, introduction and I was laughing. Like, it is hilarious. She, the first two pages of it are just brilliant. And it goes on. I mean, throughout it, she's actually funny. She has an entire chapter. I really feel like it was devoted to just trashing another author she hated. Um, every time she is using examples of creative blasphemy, she references his work and just trashes him. <laughs> She's absolutely hilarious in the book. It's a really thoughtful book, a really heavy book. It's also a motivating one because she wrote it during World War II and twice in the book she briefly references getting back to writing after a bombing raid. And I think back to that whenever I've had a bad day and I just don't feel like being creative, I'm like, she wrote one of my favorite books while being bombed by Nazis. I can get over my bad day and write. <laughs> so it's just all around. I highly recommend that book if you can track it down. I could also see inside of you that maybe if you don't have a chance to be creative, that could also drive you oh, up, yeah. you know, very, that you need <laughs> to create. I get that sense that you need to always be creating something not just in client work but for yourself yeah definitely always have to be creating um i uh said uh uh i always say that or i've been saying for a long time that my career wasn't a or you know being a filmmaker wasn't a career choice the way of coping with my own uh mental health issues uh and it really is i mean whether it was as a little kid drawing on the walls to um, getting into animation, constantly writing little stories. Uh, it was just always a really a big part of who I was. Um, you know, friends that would play like Dungeons and Dragons, instead of playing those games, I would be drawing their stories and making picture books of them or that type of thing and just always in that, that realm of thinking. So it is a very natural part of just life. And I've had jobs where I couldn't be creative and then I would get home in the evenings and I mean, Jaren and I, when we were roommates, we were broke. We couldn't afford anything, but I had some acrylic paints and we had a couple cereal boxes. So we started painting cereal boxes. 
And uh, we had, by the time we left our apartment, we had over 60 cereal boxes on the wall. We couldn't afford canvases, but we painted cereal boxes. Um, things like that, that uh, just, it is, it's something you have to do. And the beauty of it is, when I was in high school, the short film I did, uh, I had a magical moment. I, I got a letter, you know, this is before emails. I got a letter from somebody who had seen the film and she wrote to me, the film was about censorship, and she wrote to me about how it impacted her thoughts on it and changed her way of, of seeing this, the, uh, the debate over censorship that was going on around that era, of, around the era of natural born killers and true romance and gangster rap and all that stuff they were trying to ban. Um, and as a uh, you know, 17 year old me getting this letter from somebody realizing that my movie had changed their mind about something that core to our values as a, as a people, um, I was like, well, what else could I ever want to do with my life? Um, and you know, it took me 17 years to make Frey and for that to come out and then to be able to get letters from people who have seen it to see tears in people's eyes afterwards about talking about how it made them feel better about themselves or understand their family member better. Um, yeah, it's just to me, you know, if I wasn't doing, the creative part is great and I love that and I would always do that, but then to be able to use it to try and put some kind of good into the world, uh, which there's not a lot of, <laughs> so it's like put some good into the world make people feel like they understand each other better, make people feel like we're in this together. Um, and like, what else could you ever hope to accomplish as a artist? Um, so to me, that's what motivates me to keep going and keep doing my own films. Because, you know, if somebody else is paying, I might not be able to get away with some of the themes I deal with and that type of thing. Um, if you're answering to somebody, you tend to self-censor. And by the way, I, I, I should have rephrased it. I didn't mean that you would go crazy not doing art, but that it seems like that would be something more in your wheelhouse than going to the mall. And oh, yeah. Culture. Oh, totally. That's how I should have probably phrased it. But I appreciate how you, how oh, you good. added that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I, I call my apartment my cave because it's, I don't, I don't like to leave it. And um, yeah, I'm just much happier when I'm just making stuff or at least, or at the very least, Honestly, just sitting back and contemplating, reading about other, reading other people's books, um, you know, reading about other lives, other ideas, reading about philosophy or all that sort of stuff. Like I'd rather be in that world trying to understand the world than being a part of the world. <laughs> being a part of the world is not my favorite thing. Trying to understand it, I love doing. That makes sense, especially now. Yeah. What are some big revelations you've had or the biggest success you've had when developing this story about Blood From Stone? The biggest success, I mean, the film hasn't come out yet, so I'm really curious to see how people interpret it because again, it's a, it's a weird film. It's not a weird film in like the most uh, overt way. It's not something like, you know, like The Lighthouse, which is such a beautiful, brilliant film, but it's also very obviously like, you, you know going into that, it's a different movie. Um, this one is a little bit more subtle in how it's weird. So I'm curious how people are going to respond to it. But for me personally, I don't know about like a revelatory, but the thing I'm the proudest of on a very personal level, it was the first feature I've ever, I've been the cinematographer on um, as well. And it had a very complicated visual language. Adeshola, who's here with me, he and I, really sat down like shot listed and storyboarded this whole thing um, because every shot in it or every scene really is like they're they overlap and they weave and a lot of the visual dynamics of it um, communicate between scenes something you know the way a shot is composed in one scene speaks to how something's composed in another uh, what you're seeing in one storyline is complemented or contrasted in another storyline and the way the storylines interweave, if I butchered some shots, <laughs> if they didn't turn in, if I didn't get them the way that I'd intended, uh, the film would have completely fallen apart at the seams. Uh, so much of the juxtaposition between the, the interwoven storylines really is what makes some of the dramatic aspects of the film work and even some of the themes really work. Uh, 
And so when we got a final edit of it and I was watching it back, I'm like, this is absolute insanity and I can't believe it worked. <laughs> um, you know, there's almost no establishing shots in the whole movie. There's, I think, five establishing shots in the whole film, maybe four. Um, you know, we closed down Main Street in Las Vegas and had cop cars and all sort of stuff and the entire thing is done other than two shots, the entire thing's done on a very tight lens where you only are focused on the one character even though there's all this chaos going on around him. Um, just things like that that visually were um, against the grain, like not how I would, how, not how you're supposed to shoot a scene, not how you're supposed to, you know, cover it and dissect it and all that. And just believing that what I was seeing in my head was actually going to work. Um, and then coming out on the other side and like, oh, it actually did. You know, is it the most cinematically masterful film ever made? No. <laughs> but as a visual language to do something so off kilter and actually have it succeed, I'm quite excited about. How did you go about developing these vampire characters? I kind of have parts of myself in all of them. <laughs> uh, like, you know, Vanya, the Uri, you know, his performance as Yuri, I mean, he brought it to a whole nother level. But there's that part of me that's just impulsive and very much about like just living in the moment. Um, doing things you regret, not understanding why you know you ha you're perceived a certain way, all that sort of stuff. Um, Daria's character again deal with a lot of that. Deal with you know kind of my own like self repression uh, as well. So it's a lot like in a way there's so much of me in all the characters, uh, and that's I think that's just essential. It's like there's a a line that's told to every writer and it's a dangerous one where they say write what you know and too often times I find that makes writers kind of go with most obvious like well I wait tables so my character is going to be a waiter who wants to be a filmmaker <laughs> it's like no not necessarily that but put what you know into your characters like create something fantastical if you want but put yourself into those characters put people that you know into those characters so that way when you're writing them they feel authentic, they feel real. Um, especially for, for myself, like who, who needs to see another movie about some average white guy who wants to get the girl and you know ends up succeeding in the end or not or whatever. It's like that story's been told a hundred times. I don't even want to watch a movie about my life. So in terms of that, like be able to find something interesting about the life I've had, about my own persona, and put that into my characters. And then, you know, then from there, just have fun with it. Okay, here's my character. Now set him free. What are they going to do once they're out in the world? Um, you know, what's Yuri going to do when he's in a, he's in a, in an Uber ride share, and some drunk people get in next to him, and they're obnoxious. Me, I would be quiet and ignore them. His character, he's a beast and he's a vampire, so he kills them. Um, <laughs> then he feels bad for the driver, who's now stuck in the situation. And now how does he handle that? Well, you know, and so just kind of for me, it's like I like to create the characters, put them in a scenario and see where they go. What are your thoughts on writing a protagonist that's a villain? <laughs> uh, I mean... I really feel like any protagonist, if they're authentic, is also going to be a villain. Everybody's got that side to them. Um, and I hopefully I'm not just projecting myself out there by saying that. Uh, but um, to me, it's not a... I don't, I don't even like the idea of having villains, having like protagonist, antagonists. Because it's really, it's all about perspective. You know, you flip the lens around and, you know... The bad guy is actually, he's doing what he feels is the right thing to do. In his mind, he's justified. It's why, you know, you go back in history, you look at Nazi propaganda films. They didn't shoot them intending Hitler to look like the villain. But us looking back at it now, it's very iconic villain imagery. You see it in the new Star Wars films. You see it in so many movies. They take that imagery and they flip it around. That was obviously not the intent of those films. And so any character... If you write a really fleshed out character, I mean, 
even on, a, I mean, you know, the Nazi thing is a big scale. On a personal scale, we've all been in relationships. You've had a fight with your significant other. You know you're right until a certain part of the argument where you're like, oh, no, you just made a really good point. No, okay, I'm, I'm in the wrong on that. So even in that argument, like, you went into it, you were the hero, and then you ended with, like, oh, no, I'm the villain. Uh, so that's how I approach my characters is not thinking who's the good guy, who's the bad guy, who's the, you know, who's the one I'm rooting for. Uh, in the end, it's just, let's get to know them. <laughs> let's see who they are. And let the audience decide who they think is. Like one of my favorite things, and I don't want to spoil too much for those who haven't seen it, but one of my favorite things is uh, Daria's character. She starts out, she's very much the damsel in distress type of trope. She's, you know, the ex-girlfriend who ex escaped an abusive relationship. She's with this guy that we've all seen him be a monster. And then the story makes a turn. And you start realizing, you know, she's not as helpless as I thought she was. How much of a victim is she really? And then you see that she's even reconciling that of who she wants to be versus who she is. And to me, that's so much more interesting than being, oh, she's good and he's bad. Uh, I just, I feel like that's where so many movies become so cookie cutter and so boring is when it's so obvious who, who's who in the film. I, by, I want it to be, by the end of the film, you're still trying to figure out, wait, who was I supposed to be rooting for? Like, I'm happy how I ended, but why am I happy? They were terrible. Or, um, you know, kind of wanting to know more. Like, if I feel like if a movie ends and you're, you're trying to piece out in your mind where this character went and what they did, and you're still thinking about the decisions they made, then that's, that's a successful film because it makes you feel like that world was real and you cared about those characters, you found them interesting enough to contemplate. How was it writing two female characters? One of them actually had very masculine qualities to her though. Yeah. In the typical stereotype, she was very strong and was actually lifting him up. Well, she's the older sister and I have a very strong older sister. Um, she was always the boss growing up. <laughs> And even to this day, we still kind of have that fun, uh, you know, we have fun with it now, but still have that. And so writing the older sister role in the film was easy because, um, you know, and honestly, like there's a lot of strong women in my family lineage, even going back. I mean, uh, an aunt on my mother's side was a postal carrier in Alaska back when she had to get around on a dog sled uh, in the early 1900s. Um, oh, wow. Long lineage of strong women. Um, you know, great grandmother raised her kids as a single mother during the Great Depression. Um, my grandmother on my mom's side was, uh, you know, a working woman in the 50s and stuff like that. Um, and so just strong women to me, that's like, that's just how they should be written. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then just in my life, I've, I've, been one of those guys that's always had a circle of female friends. I actually enjoy them as human beings and as equals. And so knowing know them uh, on that personal level and not just seeing them as relationship or conquest. Um, and so to me, the, it uh, even when I'm writing them, there's obviously gender differences in terms of how they're, the, the specific experiences that they have throughout the film, there's gonna be that. but. I don't approach it like writing, oh, this is a woman character. To me, I'm just writing a character that happens to be a woman. Uh, my favorite author of all time, Jeanette Winterson, she, uh, she once in an interview was asked how it feels to be uh, such a, a well-respected lesbian author. And she retorted back, she's like, I'm not a lesbian author, I'm an author who happens to like women. <laughs> I feel like from the writing perspective, that's how I should treat my characters is yes, we all have aspects of our gender and race and all that that does affect our, our uh, specifics uh, in life uh, in a lot of ways. But in the end, I at least I wanna believe that we're all human beings and uh, should, when I write them, I write different characters in that way. Um, with an awareness of, you know, whatever differences that they may have from myself, but not trying to make that their defining character trait. Does that make sense? <laughs> it does. 
Did you like a lot of female characters in film noir? Oh, yeah. Because they were quite strong yeah. and at times conniving and clever. Definitely. I mean, definitely in classic films, it was interesting because, you know, we think that era, we think very defined gender roles. But uh, in classic films, I mean, you had Katherine Hepburn in Bringing Up Baby is one of my favorite performances of all time. She's just phenomenal in that in a powerhouse. Uh, you know, so there's so many great ones out there. Angela Bassett was one of my big favorites in Strange Days when I saw her in that and just how incredible she was in that when I was, you know, that was in the 90s, but just such a phenomenal performance. You have just so many strong, great performances by female actresses. You know, we were mentioning Juliette Lewis earlier. Uh, yeah, I just think being able to bring that into a film, you know, there's a lot of talk about that right now in terms of like social justice and all that. It's always been there. It's just been as, it's not been uh, as, common as it should be, um, but I don't think it's doing anything new. It's not, it's not changing anything. It's just, you know, to a certain extent, maybe it's just a reflection of, uh, of our current selves or, you know, of this, the people that created it. Like for myself, obviously I said, strong women are a natural part of my life. I'm gonna have that in my stories. Um, uh, potentially others just haven't had that and, you know, maybe that's why you don't see it as much in other films. But it's not like an active choice I make, it's just how they come out. What does story structure mean to you? Story structure for me is, uh, it's essential, and yet at the same time, I, uh, I try to ignore it, if that makes sense. It's, I mean, you know, with all this stuff, I've talked a bit about kind of like, you know, defy conventions or whatever, but I also do believe that as an artist, if you don't understand what those conventions are, what the structures are, then you're not defining them, you just don't know what you're doing <laughs> if you don't follow them. And so I really did spend, you know, read about it a lot and have, have you know, studied in terms of like story structure and the, you know, the three act, the five act structure, all that type of stuff. And there's such a value to it. I mean, even if it's not obvious that it's there in a lot of films, it should kind of be there. And so I do follow that. Like this one I feel like has like the traditional five act structure just in a very loose way. Um, and it's just, you know, if you don't hit certain plot points by certain points, you're gonna bore your audience. Uh, you know, it's one thing to challenge an audience and to ask them to really commit themselves to your story. It's another to, you know, force them to, you know, wait forever for something to happen or to not give them something to cling on to narratively. So I do try to keep the audience's interest and attention at my, in, their, in my mind when I'm, maybe not the first draft, but as I'm editing and refining the script, I like to keep that audience uh, perspective in mind. Like, okay, they have to watch this, so let me think about them now. <laughs> uh, and so that's where I think knowing the structure really comes into play is just knowing, knowing the best way to reach those beats, hit those moments. Uh, I did say earlier though, I'm not a big fan of character arcs, at least not obvious ones, because I feel like in real life, unless something traumatic happens to you, you don't actually change, you just adjust your... Um, so for me, instead of worrying about a character arc, like, well, he starts here and he ends this person, or he finds this out of himself and changes here, I kind of like to create a personality type and a psychology and then put them into a situation like, okay, now how do they cope with this? What is, cause that's kind of more how we are in real life is, you know, I am who I am. If you put me in a burning building, I'm not gonna suddenly turn into a hero. I'm probably gonna flee. <laughs> um, you know, what circumstances would it take for me to become that hero? Um, it would have to be for a loved one. Uh, my cats, depending on the day, maybe I would risk it. Uh, but you know, that's to me is the interesting thing is not necessarily like hitting the arc in the traditional way, but setting those plot points of like, okay, at this point, this character has this happen to him and he does this. And then at this point he realizes, oh, this all backfired. And then, it, you know, so that's kind of how I like to follow the structure is like you have those points, but in terms of like so much of the traditional writing on story structure and everything, I'm not a fan of a lot of the guidance on how a story should develop. Um, 
you know, obviously there's some very, very successful filmmakers that have followed those formulas and done quite well with it. So, you know, take my, my opinion on it for what it's worth. Um, I'm on my second film, we'll see how it, do, how it does. <laughs> so, but that's at least how I approach it personally. How long did you work on the screenplay? It's debatable. I mean, it, I literally have my first notes written down when I was in high school, so a few decades. Um, <laughs> Uh, it went through various different forms and then I would get discouraged because again, what am I bringing to the vampire genre that's worth the damn? Um, and then uh, when I really, when, the, when it clicked for me, like, oh, this is the story I want to tell, I started fermenting on it, write a little bit here and there, and after about four months of just kind of letting it stew in my brain and writing some notes here and there and some thoughts, and another thing I do is, because I read a lot, I have a little black book of quotes that I keep of just lines. I'm like this, because so many authors can say something in one throwaway line that would take me an entire essay to express. So I like to write those down and just keep those. And so I kind of like picked my quotes that capture the essence, the story I want to tell. Then sat down and wrote it in the first draft. I literally had it in three weeks. And then I sent it to, no, actually I revised that one. I sent the second draft to a few friends, get some feedback, some notes. Um, and then reworked it over the course of about six months and then started up on production, so. When you were in high school, where were you writing? Were like, was this during like class break or something and you're like <laughs> writing on a composite, you know, like tear out sheet from? Yeah, during class sometimes. I was not the best student. <laughs> uh, I, the fact I made it through high school was only thanks to the uh, graciousness of some teachers who believed I had potential if I just learned how to put the work in. Um, <laughs> I'm still grateful for them because uh, that really is what it comes down to is it doesn't matter how talented you are. If you don't put the work in, nobody's going to see your talent. Uh, so getting those Fs in high school was a valuable learning experience. <laughs> but yeah, I, was, I would draw and write during class, after class. I'd go home and had a cave then that I made and I would be in my little cave drawing and writing and just constantly coming up with ideas. Uh, most of them looking back garbage. I was not a prodigy. I was definitely uh, still developing a voice. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I just loved it. I absolutely loved uh, just creating little worlds or stories or ideas and imagining them. Uh, and even to this day, I mean, that's, you'll, half the time you'll find me on my patio with a book in hand, reading something or just contemplating ideas, themes, whatever. Uh, it's kind of my favorite way to pass the time. What TV shows did you watch when you were in high school? Oh, I have terrible taste in TV. Uh, let's see, what would be in high school? Actually, oddly enough, in high school, I wasn't watching a lot of TV. I watched more movies then, but I was obsessed with animation. I'm still an animation junkie. I watched South Park religiously. Um, but back then, I mean, I was watching, again, because I'm older, it was like Animaniacs. I was watching every afternoon after school. Um, loved that show. Uh, still one of the all-time greats. So I was watching that, watching old, still obsessed, but definitely back then I was obsessed with the old uh, Warner Brothers and Hanna-Barbera cartoons from Tom and Jerry to Bugs Bunny and all that stuff. Loved all those classics, Tex Avery cartoons, which... Uh, Problematic by today's standards, but I loved them back then. Uh, you know, yeah, I was a true animation junkie for, and then I've always been a news junkie too. I watched the news almost every night. Um, you know, during my high school years were uh, some pretty, you know, def for me, defining moments in uh, kind of the way I saw our society and our, you know, authority and stuff like that with. Um, you know, we had the, uh, the Branch Davidians in Waco when I was, you know, just entering my teens. Then you had the Columbine shootings and, you know, I mean, I had made some films up at that point in my, in my high school with friends where there were guns involved and stuff like that in the, in, you know, fake guns. But I was doing that and then the Columbine thing happened and just everything changed. Um, and so, uh, yeah, but that to me was... Uh, what I watched, I would go between cartoons and then the serious stuff. And I'm still kind of that way. Like I've seen all the Fast and Furious films and then I'll go watch some art house and then I'll go read the news. So.
What screenwriting mistakes have you made in your earlier work that you've corrected? Oh, so many mistakes in my early work. Uh, the biggest one, and it still survives in a short film that I made, uh, was monologues. Oh my God, I used to write some obscenely long, pretentious monologues. <laughs> As you can probably tell, I'm very opinionated about things, you know, kind of philosophical about things. And I would put way too much of that into my characters, and it was annoying. And I feel bad for the actors that had to try and deliver those things. Um, that was the big one, learning to, you know, the obvious things, show, not tell. Uh, that was hard for me. Uh, it really took trusting my own abilities as a filmmaker, trusting the audience uh, is another big part of it. You know, we've all got this idea that because Fast and the Furious is so popular, because kind of derivative films are so popular that audiences aren't smart. They are smart, just sometimes they want to turn their brain off. But if you're making a film that, allow, that encourages them to turn their brain on, they'll go just as deep as you want them to go. And so that to me was a big part of it, is learning to write better, for sure, learning to write smarter, but then also trusting that I don't have to explain everything to the audience, that they can figure it out. Um, and that just, that took time and experience, you know, going to festivals and seeing how audiences responded to my films, seeing how they really responded to other films, and just, you know, learning to trust both myself and audiences was the biggest change for me and not being so on the nose about my writing. Has overwriting ever been an issue for you? I know you talked about you had these characters with these monologues and their opinions and things, yeah. but in terms of the actual story, has overwriting ever been an issue for you? Um, I haven't done that much overwriting. Uh, Blood from Stone, I definitely chopped a good chunk of it off. I mean, I already knew the film that I had in my mind was not going to be a 90-minute film. It was going to be, I was assuming at least 145, 150, maybe even 155. The fact it's over two hours, uh, my distributors weren't happy about that. But upon seeing it, they're like, it works. It's tight. It's a tight two-hour and four-minute movie. But um, even with that, the script itself did have some. And it was really that. It's still... My natural go-to is I'm going to write it down and then, um, so I had a lot of dialogue that was way too long. You know, I'm sure you noticed there's the scene of the brother and sister in the bar talking. That goes on for a little while. I love it. A few people that love it. Some say it's too long. I left it in. Um, I think the actors did great with it, so I, I, I enjoy it on that level. Um, but yeah, I do find myself doing that, and I oftentimes my first draft and my second draft, or maybe first to third draft, there's at least a 10 page difference of how much I've cut out. Uh, Frey was the only one that wasn't that way. Frey was just a very short, succinct script. The actual script for that is just over 60 pages. Um, it was a very short, succinct one, so. And was a lot of the dialogue um, improv? No, it was just that film has so many scenes of, I mean, there's only so many ways you can write. He looks off in the distance depressed. <laughs> and, you know, but when you're shooting it and you have Brian's phenomenal performance with Jaron's amazing cinematography, that one line is a minute or two minutes of the film. And it's an incredibly powerful minute or two minutes because of the visuals and the performance in it. But because I wasn't trying to sell the script, I wasn't trying to impress anybody with the script, it was literally going to be re read by our team. I didn't fl embellish with a bunch of descriptions or anything like that. I was just like, you know, the character's name is Justin. I'm like, Justin walks to, uh, you know, the job interview. He, you know, then I write the job interview dialogue. And then he walks home. I wouldn't... <laughs> you know, embellish and all that, because I had it in my head. I knew Jaron was going to make it look great, and I knew Brian was going to kill it as a performer. So wrote a really lazy script for that one. Probably not the best thing to say to inspire people to get really good at being professional writers. <laughs> um, but because, like I said, I wasn't trying to sell it, I wasn't trying to impress anybody with it, I just wrote it for me and my little crew. So that's why that one I got away with being lazy. I think that kind of says a lot in that, that you weren't really writing for the market. Yeah. You weren't writing to impress whomever. It was just a story that you really want to tell. You had a family member that experienced this. You'd met people. 
and yeah. that that's where a lot of that came from. It was wild too because uh, when it came out and we got the good reviews and stuff like that, I got an email one day from the Academy of Motion Pictures Arts and Sciences and they requested a copy of the script for their permanent library, which was amazing. Um, and I was just like, I'm kind of embarrassed to say, give them this script. It's like, you know, it, I, let me at least create a proper title page for it. Um, and uh, yeah, so it was kind of wild that like probably my laziest script so far has been my most successful. <laughs> so um, I don't know what that says about me as a writer. Maybe I just shouldn't try so hard. Or it's just the story that you're writing and how connected yeah, you are. I think that's a big part of it is really like the story and that one just, there was so much of my own, you know, I told you about the research I did, getting to know so many people who were living that life, my own cousin's experiences. It kind of just, that one just flowed out and I had a very specific idea for it. So um, I think that's kind of key in writing is, you know, really know what you're writing have a have a like really believe it and just trust it as you're writing it how do you work with actors i have a great time working with actors and pretty much all the actors i've worked with still like me so that's a good sign <laughs> i uh when i'm working with actors i really try to focus on the early stages one is just getting them to feel comfortable with me because they're putting a lot of faith in me as a director uh, that I'm going to steer them in the right direction, that I know what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, every actor, especially, you know, um, people who are starting out or, or uh, that do a lot of supporting work, so many of them get thrown into these just terrible movies where they're almost ashamed they were part of it. Um, and so they're putting a lot of faith in me as a director and as a writer that, you know, that I'm going to deliver for them. And so kind of get them to comfortable, let them know kind of my vision, who I see their character as, what I see it saying, all that. But then I work with them to feel really comfortable with their understanding of the character. Even before we get into lines, um, really talking with them, who did they see their character as? What is, you know, when a character does this in a scene, do you have any questions about that? Or is there any questions you have about your character? Um, I really want them to feel like they know that person and that that for when they're playing them, they're not, they're not thinking about notes they had. There's nothing worse, I mean, there's a lot of uh, actors process and each of them has their own process. Some of them write a very complicated chart that tracks their character's arc and their choices throughout the whole film, which is great because you want, you know, if that's how they do it, you want them to feel like they know their character and they understand it and they can see the whole thing. But the last thing you want to see is when they're performing, you don't want to see them thinking about those notes. You want them to be living in the moment. And so getting them to the point where they trust they know the character, that's when I know I have, I have a good performance. Once we get to that stage, I start feeling really good about it. Um, you know, when we're doing Frey, Brian, uh, we walked, worked on his walk for days, getting his walk down to where you could see that he had the physical wound, but you could also see he was trying to hide it. Um, him spending that time with those, uh, those veterans was a huge breakthrough for him. It changed his, his own personal perspective on it. He actually said to me after that, he said, he goes, I was really excited about this movie because it's an incredible role and I you know, really feel like it's a great opportunity for me as an actor. But after meeting these guys, he's like, I, all I can think about now is I just hope I can do their story justice. And that to me was when it changed. It became a, for him it wasn't about playing a role, it became real to him. Uh, he saw the lives that those guys had, and obviously I couldn't do that with the vampire film, but part of it with them was, you know, the casting. Vanya's from Serbia, Gabby's from Hungary, uh, and so they come from the worlds that these vampires are from. They had that folklore and stuff growing up, so that was a big part of it already. Naturally, their accent is there, so we have to come up with some cheesy Dracula accent. Um, but then helping them understand and find those connections that they have to them personally. And then from there, creating on set an environment where they feel safe to take risks, to not feel like if they flub a line that I'm going to be upset with them. Um, 
And for Vanya, part of it, he's an amazing talent, but English isn't his first language. Uh, you know, he struggled with some of my dialogue, so let, allow him the freedom to make it his own. And some of his improv in it and some of the lines he came up with was so much better than what I wrote. Uh, he has some throwaway lines that, I, that still make me laugh, and I've seen the film a thousand times now. Uh, so he, allowing them to really personalize it and make it themselves and not feeling like as the writer director that I'm losing my vision because they're taking something in a new way. It's almost like, okay, let's go for this ride. Let's see where they take me now. Uh, and I just find like that just helps. It's again, it's empowering to them, keeps them from feeling like they're walking on eggshells that, you know, worrying about making a mistake. Um, but then also not being afraid to correct them. If something's really, you know, if the choice isn't right, having that conversation, catching them early on it, feeling like, you know, again, if you have that trust, they're going to respect when I speak up and I'm like, no, that's not how, how your character would go. We can have that discussion. They can understand why. Um, had that with Vanya, had that with Gabby, had that with Brian, have, had that with all my actors where you have that moment where it's like, you know, it's great. I like what you were trying to do there, but let's think about it from this perspective of why your character wouldn't do that. And I always say, if I can't justify a choice, it's not the right choice. So with any actor, I always have that justification. Otherwise, let them do it their way. Um, if I'm going to give them a note, there's going to be a reason for it. Otherwise, I want them to feel like they've got it. What are the pros and cons of working with non-actors? You know, when you see movies sometimes, let's say Winner's Bone, where you're like, you know what, those are real people, it seems yeah. like for the most part in the background, and it really lends to the film. And just from watching the trailer of Frey, I think you had said that there were non-actors in it, but yeah. I, I could, it, it really made me feel like I was there in a town, a small town, logging area. It's for... For any film, I think it's it can be great. If you want to if you want to have authenticity, just use the real people. Uh, it makes a world of difference because, you know, great character actors can embody interesting characters for sure. Uh, but there is still something different from an actor playing somebody like that versus the real person. That's their life and that's what they do. Um, so authenticity is the greatest attribute of it. Um, for a low budget film, you know, there's no way on a movie like that I was able to cast and afford uh, 30 great extras <laughs> or, with, or uh, you know, supporting roles and stuff like that. Like you, I can only bring on so many people and I would rather have somebody who's real and maybe not the best actor versus a bad actor who's not real. <laughs> um, you know, if you threw, like, the, uh, there's a scene where he's interviewing for a job at a Dairy Queen, and Becky was the actual manager of that Dairy Queen who does, does the scene in the interview. Now, she just had to be herself. She was doing an actual job interview. It just happened to be on camera. And she was nervous and everything, but we got her comfortable, and she did it. And, and with non-actors, I don't give them dialogue. I give them point A and point B, now just be you. And then the actor, you know, Brian was great at improv, improv, so he could go with it, he could roll with it. He knew things he had to get across, so he would steer it that way. So that's part of having a very talented actor to work with that can steer a scene like that. Um, but with Becky, I was just like, okay, you're interviewing him. He's got to have these qualifications. You've got to ask him about this. And then just do a normal interview. And then trust also that you can pull it off in editing and make it work. So that was a big thing. And one of my favorite moments from that was when LA Weekly put out their review. They ended the review quoting Becky. She actually had a line in that um, that when, when she said it, I was just like, that's better than anything I will ever write. Um, it was a question she asked him, uh, what do you think qualifies you to work uh, at this establishment? And he retorts back, well, you know, I did five tours of duty here, but I don't see how that'll help me, at a, you know. And uh, her response back is, well, it can be a battlefield in here sometimes, especially during the summer. And I'm just like, I would have never thought of that, and that's the greatest <laughs> answer to that, to that ever. Um, and I love the fact that this woman who's a manager at a Dairy Queen in the coastal mountains of Oregon was literally quoted in the LA Weekly. So that's, that's the beauty of having a non-actor, is they can bring that level of realness to it, because that's their daily life. And so if you just let them be themselves, but that's the hard part as a director is you can't 
you can't direct them. You literally give them um, the scenario and then just trust them to be themselves. And then hopefully you get what you need out of it. So you're also not getting a lot of takes. <laughs> uh, you do more than two or three takes, they start getting self-conscious and then you've lost them. You had a 300 plus page production Bible? Yes. <laughs> Can you tell us when you started assembling that and did you leave anything out? So yeah, the production Bible, I'd never compiled anything like this before uh, other than obviously editing a feature, I guess is a bigger task. But um, with this film, because it was a very modest budget and uh, and I guess because I just wanted to drive myself insane, I decided not only was I directing and shooting it, but I was also going to be doing the production design, props, costumes, set dressing, all of that. And so I knew if I didn't have every detail of it written down, I would lose track first day into shooting. I would have no idea what shot is next. I would, if I just had a shot list, I wouldn't remember like, well, what was the composition? What was I even think? Why was I, you know, why did I want us to stay in close-ups the whole time? Why didn't I want to have it? So I knew I needed to have it all laid out. So I had all the storyboards. Um, I had all the, every scene was broken down by each shot. In each shot, what props were needed, what costumes were needed, which actors were in it, which were extras, um, vehicles, the location, everything broken down because I knew if I didn't have that, you know, I'd only done one feature before, but I knew in that one, there were times where Jaren and I would be looking at the script and the shot list, trying to remember like, wait, how did that scene end? Okay, that scene ended in a close up, so we can't start this one with a close up. And we'd be like, no, wait, no, no, we ended it with a wide shot. So, okay, we do start this one with a close, like trying to figure out the visual language. And I was, you know, Jaren for the longest time was a crutch for me, the guy's just, you know, a master of visual storytelling that I didn't really have to worry about it much. Well, you know, he's doing big movies now. So I was like, well, I guess I'll just shoot this one myself. <laughs> and, uh, um, but yeah, without having him as a crutch, I was really nervous going into it and then having so many different responsibilities creatively on it. Uh, I, just, I had to, and I'm so glad I did. Because if I didn't have that production Bible, this thing would have been a just a flaming train wreck, so. Any advice to filmmakers on how they should begin one? Maybe it won't be 300 plus yeah. pages, but, but, but just a, a more condensed version? I mean, definitely have all those elements, because if you're, if you're doing a lower budget film, you probably don't have somebody who's a department head for all the props and a department head for costumes and all that. You probably have, if you're lucky, you have one person that's overseeing that. Um, sometimes it's just, you know, everybody's taking turns on it and you've got actors bringing their own wardrobe or whatever. But if you do that breakdown, you, know, you think about things like, okay, in this scene, these three guys get bitten by a vampire, so their shirts are gonna get bloody, which means I am bringing their shirts because I'm not paying for their laundry bills. Uh, plus, probably won't wash out. So knowing that type of stuff and then just realizing, um, you know, when you're doing that, when you're doing that shot list, you start thinking about little things that you wouldn't necessarily think about, like, um, there's a scene in it where uh, he throws a cell phone out the window. It wasn't until I was going through really like putting together this production Bible where I'm like, oh, I need to bring a disposable <laughs> phone. I need to bring a phone that's dead so, or that nobody wants anymore. Cause otherwise, I guess it'll be my phone we throw out the window. Um, so that sort of thing, like, you know, uh, trying to reach out to friends, like, hey, anybody got an old cell phone they don't need anymore? That still powers on. Um, stuff like that. like. I wouldn't have thought of that. And so I highly recommend putting together not just a shot list, but really some level of a production Bible where you know every day when you walk onto set, you've already gone through a checklist of the props that you need, the costumes you need, making sure that you have the people that you need, um, and all this sort of stuff. And granted, a lot of that's a producer, you know, producer role, other department heads, but we just, on this one, it was really, I mean, Michael's an amazing producer and he handled the logistics well, but a lot of the department heads were, me and other people just kind of putting our heads together. And so we've got, you know, Nika helping as a production coordinator, but she's also acting in, you know, quarter of the movie. Uh, you've got Sarah as my AD and script supervisor, but she's also acting in part of the movie, um, as well as she's helping Jeff Black with sound and she's helping with getting, you know, 
helping Michael arrange food deliveries and all this sort of stuff. Like we're all pulled in so many different directions. The fact that we could all go back to this production Bible and see, oh, we've got this, we've got this, this is taken care of, this is checked off. It's a great feeling and there's nothing like finishing the day and just seeing everything on the page checked off. It's the greatest feeling in the world. Like we got it all. We can go to sleep now. <laughs> so highly recommend it. It's a lot of tedious work to start with, but it's the most gratifying thing while you're shooting because just knowing you got everything and being able to check it all off as you accomplish it, it just gives you peace of mind. And are you just getting like a three ring binder yeah. and then and then putting in stuff in these like plastic um, exactly. separators? Oh, yeah, okay. it is. It's just, it's a three ring binder. Um, I've got uh, basically each scene has a divider between it. So um, when I'm making it, that's the other hard part is like, so I made it just in the order of the script, but then once Michael and I had our shooting schedule down, I reorganized it by day. So it's like, okay, well, we're doing this this day. So that was the tricky part with this one because, you know, certain scenes, just like in any film, you break them up. This one's being shot at that part of the day. This one's being shot at that part of the day. We had, we had certain scenes that part of them were shot in Laughlin, part were shot in Vegas, and part were shot in LA. Um, so breaking it up by day was also essential because we'd be like, okay, on day, you know, once you get to day 20, <laughs> You know, the script doesn't even mean anything to you anymore. It's all abstract at that point. It's like, you know, your brain is just such a jumbled mess. So you can look at, okay, on day 20, oh good, okay, we're doing the apartment scene. So we don't have to deal with crowds, we don't have to deal with the casino, we don't have to deal with that. But, you know, we've got to make sure we have the blood bags. We've got to make sure that we have her running shoes and we have to have this and that. Um, so it just, it was, uh, it was essential for that and then, um, like I said, just breaking it down by day was essential too. And we just had the divider between each one. And then I also had, of course, had the PDF file and I would just, each day, print out a couple of copies for everybody to have. So that way, you know, again, checklist. Uh, Nika going through costumes, making sure we had extras costumes and we had the, you know, that Vanya had the right shirt on that day that matched with the other scenes and stuff like that. So. Um, yeah, highly recommend keep it as organized as possible, as thorough as possible. Again, it's tedious. It's a very tedious process. I spent probably as much time putting on the production Bible as I did the first draft of the script, <laughs> but it saved me so many times and kept just kept it all organized. I didn't have to think, like I could look, you see, uh, you know, right here you've got your uh, shot, uh, the storyboard with the shot description underneath it and you can see all the shots lined up. She's like, oh, that's why I decided to go in for a close-up here, because it was described and it made sense, whereas if it had just been storyboard or a shot list, it wouldn't have worked for me. Now granted, that's if you have, you know, not everybody needs storyboards. We didn't do it on Frey, um, partly because oftentimes I would just defer to Jaren on visuals. Um, but, you know, not everybody needs that, but I feel like the more information you have, the better. Because that's one thing I did find was scary when I was doing Frey is that feeling of forgetting even what you were doing. <laughs> it's like, wait, where are we today? We've shot like four scenes and we're going into five. I don't even remember what this is in the script. I don't remember what I was trying to accomplish with it. Um, so yeah, I just think it's essential to have that. How do you plan a shoot where you know there will be rain, where rain is an actual part of the scene? <laughs> um, I try not to write too much around Mother Nature because while she can be an amazing gaffer at times, she also can be very finicky. Um, and in fact, Frey, I'd initially written it, I mean, we shot it in March in the coastal mountains of Oregon, thinking it was just gonna be gloomy, gray, and wet the whole time. And it was so sunny while we were shooting, we'd go to lunch and the waitress would be like, oh, you're so lucky. It's never this nice in the spring. I was like, oh, I wanted gloom. I wanted rain. <laughs> that being said, when it does happen, I, you know, this is a budget thing. When it comes to mother nature in terms of like rain and the elements, I always prefer artificial to the real deal. Um, shooting in the real rain is just, it's hellish. Um, you know, especially if you don't have proper, 
you know, if you don't have a huge budget and you have all the proper tents and the proper housing for the camera and all that sort of stuff, it's, I mean, the anxiety of like, oh, I don't want to get the camera wet. So you've got your AC instead of pulling focus, he's got an umbrella over your head. Um, you know, all that type of stuff. I try to use artificial rain and snow or whatever when I can. Now, granted, usually it's commercial projects that have that budget. It's not my own. Uh, but even, you know, shooting Vegas the best and Laughlin, the best time we had was, uh, was August. And August in Nevada is not pleasant. Um, poor Adeshola was crammed to the back of that Prius for three nights of shooting in the trunk, monitoring audio and and sound while I'm up in the passenger seat shooting it. And we have no air conditioning on because it's 100, you know, for audio, but, you know, 115 degrees outside. Um, so, yeah, I personally try to avoid the elements as much as possible because I just, like, I could never do the Revenant. That would, I would, uh, I'd probably give up about a week in. <laughs> um, I know some filmmakers love that type of stuff. I personally, I prefer to, I prefer, uh, you know, even if it's something as simple as a garden hose for rain, I'll use that, you know, put your thumb over it, have it far enough away, get the rain, use some post effects to kind of gloom it up a little bit and add some depth to it. Um, that's the joy of knowing how to do some basic special effects is I know how to, I know how to fake a lot of that type of stuff and do it where it looks convincing enough that people don't notice that it's fake. What's your favorite scene in the movie? Blood from Stone? Oh, favorite scene. It's a tough one. Um, I'm kind of, it's like my friend Bobby who plays Mike the convention goer, his death scene, every time I see it I text him and just tell him how much I love watching him die. Um, he just, I love that scene. Uh, you know, Gabby's performance in it is just vicious and so cold and just this great turning point. So I like that one, but I really think my favorite one is uh, is the conversation with Nika and Vanya as, uh, you know, Victoria and Yure, just brother and sister, just, you know, shooting the shit, having a great time with getting a little drunk and just talking about the good old days and their back and forth and their dynamic. It was a fun scene to write it's obviously somewhat exposition heavy. They tried to make it fun. And then just their deliveries, like they brought it to life so well that for me, it's the first dialogue scene I've ever written that I'm actually really proud of. And a lot of it is really their, their delivery and the way that they were just, you know, so great together on camera. And even though it's a long scene, I enjoy it every time I see it. I just love what they did with it, so. That's my favorite. Yeah, I think you learn a lot about the characters and their motivations from that scene. I mean, I don't want to, I don't know if this is a spoiler, but is it that, and we may have to take this out, where she says, like, dad's going to cut you off if you don't clean up your act? Yeah, and, yeah. And then you go, oh, now I see this guy better. Okay, now exactly. I get some of who he is, you know. Yeah, like you see, he's kind of like the black sheep, the rebellious one, the guy that, you know, never, you know, and especially for people that are into vampire lore, you know, for the first like half of the movie, you're like, these are weird vampires. And then when Nika's character arrives, you start to find out why they're so different. Like she's really, really a lot more of this typical vampire mm -hmm. image and type of personality type. Um, and then you start to see why the two that you've been following are not like the vampires that you would normally see in a movie. And, you know, again, try not to be too exposition heavy or too, too heavy handed trying to make it fun the whole way through, but really allowing their backgrounds, like you see why she has such a animosity toward him. You see why he is so lonely, why he acts the way he does. Um, recently, a uh, uh, person I watched it was uh, talking about how chatty he is. Like, he's a chatty vampire. And then he, as it goes on, you start to realize like, oh, this guy is, like lonely like he's a monster and he doesn't have anyone left in his life like he's a lonely person who just kind of wants to be loved <laughs> and so um you know even though he's a monster and he's done terrible things to people like he started to you know so that sort of aspect I, um and that's really the scene where it really comes out like he and vanya does just such a great job with 
being both this just barbarian beast, but also being very vulnerable and very uh, almost like this like childlike innocence. Like he's this guy that just never grew up, um, never learned how to take no for an answer or have to have responsibility or anything like that. And uh, yeah, so I think he just, you know, he delivers so well in that one. Like there's, a, there's one moment of it that still, every time he, his line delivery just brings a little tear to my eye. I'm just like, he's just like, oh, that's really sad. <laughs> and he just, he just sells it so well, so. How are you releasing Blood From Stone? Good question. We're still sorting it out because everything's kind of been thrown topsy-turvy with the whole COVID lockdown stuff. You know, the initial plan of doing like a limited little theatrical release and then going to VOD kind of got torpedoed. And going straight to VOD, there's nothing wrong with that and I'd be fine with it. But trying to figure out something and so, you know, who knows, fingers crossed, I hope this can happen. Talking about doing drive-in theaters, um, seeing about that possibility. So I would love to, I think, I think it's the right type of film for that. Frey would have been terrible for drive-ins. <laughs> um, that's just not the right atmosphere for it. I think this one could be a fun one for that. So I'm hoping we can make that work, but um, if it doesn't, in either way, it'll you know go straight, it'll also same time go to VOD and streaming services, but um, it may, you know, depending on, you know, what uh, Indie Rights finds out with the whole market, they're, they've got one film they're trying it out with first before mine. So depending on how that goes, we'll see if it's if it's worth doing. Um, you know, if people actually show up for no name indies at drive-ins, then it'd be great. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of name cachet in terms of uh, uh, drawing in audiences, so it's really going to depend on what audiences are up for. And with the VOD uh, strategy, I mean, that's where you're going to find most of your audience anyways with a, uh, a no-name indie. And sometimes it takes time. I mean, it took Frey, not only did, I mean, we reached those heights, it took almost four years for it to peak at, you know, top 15 war and military films. So, you know, it's not like the old days where you released it, you have a big boom of attention and then it kind of drifts off. It's like, you know, it's a long game with distribution with a no-name indie. It's like, you know, at first, people might get a little bit of attention from reviews, from all that type of stuff, but it's still gonna be, uh, you know, it's gonna take time to build up that grassroots unless you got, you know, $100,000 to dump into marketing. It's gonna be word of mouth. People that see it, recommend it to somebody else. That person recommends it to somebody else. And then hopefully enough people start watching it that the, uh, you know, algorithms of all these different websites start clicking in and start lifting it up in the rankings and then you know, you get enough reviews on Amazon, you get enough reviews on IMDb and stuff like that. People start taking notice. And uh, so it's kind of like we're doing everything we can to try and like, you know, build up enough of a release for it that it'll have the attention to make at least, at least a little bit of a splash. You know, um, Frey, Frey was a hard one. It was, uh, when it first came out, until the LA Times review came out, I couldn't pay anyone to care about that movie. Um, even with our festival wins, it was hard to get anybody to really care. Um, you know, we had some distributors interested, but in terms of media, interviews, nobody cared. <laughs> it, you know, the LA Times review really turned that around. But even then, it was like that was, too, that was the day it was released, so it was too late to create a splash. So it became, again, about the long game. This one, hopefully, it'll be a little bit of both. Hopefully, once it releases, we'll be able to get a lot of great reviews or, uh, you know, really hope they're it's great reviews but you know we get a lot of reviews get a lot of attention for it and then it can build up that word of mouth because you know thanks to streaming your film it's not like the old video store days where you know your film would be on the shelf for a week and then the next week it'd be in the bargain bin um it's online as long as those platforms last so uh you know you got time to make back your investment as long and that was going back to like that quote from michael madison from indie rights where he you know be able to do it for a price where you can make your money back on VOD is essential. Um, you know, you're not going to make back a $2 million budget or a $5 million budget through VOD alone. Um, but you can with, uh, you know, with smaller budgets, so. How does the buzz from Blood From Stone compare to Frey? 
I mean, already, even though the film's not out yet, the buzz for Blood from Stone is infinitely more than it was for Frey. Um, Frey, it was wild because, you know, we got Grand Jury Prize Dance with Films, got a couple of the Best Film Awards, stuff like that. And even with that, it was so hard to get anybody to care about a no-name, depressing drama um, about, you know, veterans' issues. It's kind of like box office poison. Um, so, you know, we had distributors interested. The reason I liked going with indie rights was because they were much more, they seemed very honest and straightforward about what to expect from the movie. I didn't trust any distributor that said it was going to do great. Um, but, uh, and they did, they delivered on it, but it was so hard to get anybody to care. I mean, even just getting a blogger to interview us was a chore. Um, whereas this one, I had a teaser trailer cut about a year ago, like right after we wrapped shooting, I had a teaser trailer cut, and Lyndon Michael had it for one of the film markets. They just wanted to show people about this film that they have in the works, and uh, you know it'll be coming out in a year. And the thing literally got pirated from a private server and leaked out to YouTube. It was like, I could, like literally nobody watched my trailer for free when I released it a little and pirated it. Um, so it was weird to think that and had similar issues with like the new trailer that just released. Like as soon as we put it out, it was just popping up every, on a bunch of other sites. And so it's just interesting to do a movie that people are actually excited to see. Um, now again, there's no big names, but it, you know, apparently from, I mean, it's always hard when you're the critic because I look at it and I just see a lot of stuff I wish I could have done better or that sort of thing. But the reception I'm getting from it, from people who have seen it, is that, you know, it looks like a really exciting, very high production value film. Uh, just, and different. You know, people love the fact that it looks different. So it's really crazy to see that. That being said, there's still, you know, there's going to be a lot of work put into amplifying that buzz. And that's, that's the, I would say my least favorite part about the whole filmmaking process is the marketing promotion side of it. Cause it's like, you know, takes this thing that for so long has been this pure art form and now I'm turning into a commodity <laughs> and trying to sell it. And like, okay, what is going to sell this? And all of it just feels cheap and wrong. <laughs> um, so that's the part I'm trying to get my brain wrapped around. We, again, we don't have much of a budget. So it's, you know, so much of it's going to be in the hands of myself and the cast and crew to really self-promote it as much as possible. Um, and so I'm f grateful for the fact that there's already been some interest and people just seem to really like what they see with it. Uh, and I guess knowing, you know, for anyone that at least looks into me, knowing that, you know, coming from the world of doing something like Frey, knowing that if I'm doing a vampire movie, it's not gonna be, you know, typical. Uh, I think that's helping too. What are your expectations from Blood From Stone? <laughs> um, the expectations that keep me awake at night or the ones that I'm optimistically hoping for? <laughs> Maybe both. Um, yeah, I, uh, I don't know. I, I tend to be a very hopeful pessimist. Uh, I really hope that, that this film can speak on a deeper level to people. Like I made it intentionally, it's a very, I hope it's a really entertaining film that people enjoy and they walk out of being like, that was a fun ride. Um, you know, some of those films I mentioned earlier that I grew up loving, all of them were a fun ride. It didn't matter how serious or dark they got. They're also kind of a thrill to watch. Like I wanted to do that, but I also, you know, we did a test screening of it and during the, you know, we had everybody fill out a form, answering some questions and afterwards just, you know, asked him a few questions and a few of them said like, I actually don't know what to say about the movie yet. I, there's a lot to process. And I like that. I don't know, you know, what they're gonna come, you know, what people are gonna come back with. They might process it and go, wow, that was a, you know, load of, load of horse crap. Um, or maybe they'll process it and it'll speak to them on a lot of levels. Uh, but I just hope that, you know, it's one that does at least f make people think, um, make, you know, reflect on their own past, their own actions, how, you know, how our actions can infect others' lives, how, uh, you know, how somebody, you know, with so much of the politics and social stuff going on, 
thinking about the impact of the past, and not just my own personal past actions, but historical past actions of an era that's putting me in the position that I'm in now that allows me to have advantages that others don't have and how that might breed resentment, how that might, and try to understand why people might not, you know, might have some animosity, might have some, some feelings that aren't overly positive, even though I personally don't feel I've done anything wrong. Um, those sorts of ideas, or for somebody that's dealt with an abusive relationship, for them to find that strength to, to escape from it and to know that going out on your own, um, no matter who you are or where you're coming from, and going out on your own means having that freedom to make mistakes. So that's what I'm really hoping for is, I like films that make you think. I like films that afterwards you have a long discussion about. Uh, I remember you know, watching uh, uh, the movie Enter the Void. Couldn't stand that film but was mind blown by it at the same time. I was like, I mean, friends I went to see with, we had a four hour conversation after the movie just about the movie. Um, and I still personally, not a fan of the film, hated all the characters in it, but it was an amazing film that just, like I have so much more respect for something like that than something you walk out of and you start thinking about it and you're like, wait, I don't even remember what I just watched. <laughs> so, that's what I'm hoping to get out of it. Um, and then on an aspirational side, I would love for it to do well because honestly, I want to do a sequel for it. I really do. I want, I want to explore the matriarchy of this vampire clan. I want, I want to meet their mom. I want to see uh, Victoria and her wife, Claudia. I want to see where uh, Daria's life goes. And I want want to be able to do that story. So that's the aspirational hope for it, is that uh, it does well so I can keep exploring that world. Is that your next project or that's just Theoretically, in the future? Oh. It'd be more mm -hmm. expensive than this one, so this movie better do really well, otherwise that's not happening. Because <laughs> um, that one requires castles and I also want to have flashbacks to when, uh, when uh, Yure first met Daria and where her animosity for him started, why she has a, you know, a grudge against him. Uh, I want to show her life, you know, kind of where it was. Dealing with that cyclical nature of existence and, you know, uh, civilizations and all that, I would love the sequel to actually explore that show, literally have those flashbacks of the past and how those are so tied to the, the, the now and the present and be able to show that full circle as opposed to just talk about it. So um, yeah, I would love to go that direction with it if I can. Um, if not, I have another micro budget script that I'm working on that deals with a lot of other similar themes, but is also a passion project that I've had for a while fermenting in the back of my head. If you were gonna teach your own impromptu film class, what five movies would you require the students to watch? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, the five movies I would have them watch. The first one, I already mentioned it, uh, Sam Sarah. Um, just the most pure, perfect form of filmmaking. Uh, that film I saw it four times in the theater. It made me cry every time at the end. It is one of the most powerful films I've ever seen, and there's not a word of dialogue or narration, it's literally images, music, and profound storytelling. So that one just as an experiment in like, this is the purest form of cinema there is, uh, at least in my perspective. Um, the other one, Steve McQueen's Hunger. Um, I remember walking out of Hunger, being both mind blown and depressed because I realized I'll never make a film nearly that good. <laughs> but. McQueen's ability to make the most visceral, exhausting, brutal movie that is composed of long takes and almost no speaking uh, is just breathtaking. Again, just pure, perfect cinema. Uh, so definitely those two. Then it would be uh, Dr. Strangelove uh, for that one is just how, it's like the perfect political satire, the perfect film for, you know, you take a director like Kubrick who's so known for heavy, heavy films with very like nuanced performances and just to go over the top and 
to be able to dissect that, I, mean, I could talk about that one for a long time, but just how that film has all the trademark Kubrick things, but done in such a different way. Um, and to really understand comedy, if you don't know comedy, your films are gonna be boring. Um, understand how comedy works, I think is so essential to filmmaking. Uh, you, you know, I, if I had one regret about Freights, I didn't have enough l levity in it. Uh, so definitely that one. Um, God, what would it be? Uh, so that's three. Yeah. I'm trying to think. Um, oh. Uh, I would have to go like way back to. Um, Do you ever see uh, Force of Nature? Uh, I forget even the director's name, but uh, I only found out about it because uh, Scorsese said in an interview it was one of his favorite films. Like, well, I got to check it out. It's a film noir. Um, it's such a, it's a, you know, because it's older, it's a little bit simpler. It's not relying on like extreme production value or whatever. Pacing, dialogue, performance, all the plot points is one of the most efficient, enjoyable films I've ever seen. Uh, so that one, just for like efficient, smart storytelling, it's so good. And then, oh God, um, probably honestly like a J.J. Abrams movie just because the guy, like if you want to make money, learn from the master. This guy does pop culture movies better than anybody. <laughs> you know, him or Spielberg, one of those two where it's like, you know, take one of their big hits and like never forget to entertain your audience either. I think is like a key part of filmmaking is you know, you can learn all the artistry, all the craft, have all the heady stuff in there. But don't forget, people paid money or gave you time of their life. And let them enjoy it too. So that'd be my, my course. <laughs> that'd be your course? Okay. And uh, what would be the hardest curriculum? I mean, sorry, what would, sorry, what would be the hardest uh, part of the curriculum? What would be the one like, sort of like tough love uh, part of the class? that uh, maybe the students would balk at, but you feel like they would need to know? Um, I, would, I don't know. I think like my own regret, I actually, I used to do, uh, I used to do talks at different film schools and I always would tell people the one thing that, and you'll hate to hear this because I didn't listen to it when I was younger and the only way I ever learned this was tripping and falling flat on my face a hundred times, running into walls, trying to look for an exit or a doorway to the next step, learn how to start up a business. <laughs> if every film you do is a business startup, and if you don't know how to properly start up a business, you are going to lose your ass, for, forget my language, but you're, gonna, you're going to, you know, it's, unless, you, unless you're fortunate enough to have you know, proper investors and a producer and executive producer and all those people that are managing that for you. If you're doing like bootstraps, like making your own film your way with whatever proceeds you could wrangle up, you're making, you're starting up your own business. Approach it as one, no matter how low your budget is. Um, have, a strat have a startup strategy, have a marketing strategy, have all that from the moment that you're like, oh, this is the script I'm gonna make. From that moment on, start treating it like a business uh, as well, because if you don't, you're going to make a lot of lot of dumb mistakes that I've made a hundred times and learned the hard way. So I would honestly, if I was truly teaching a filmmaking course, I would have a whole section on business startups, and and you know what do they say? Ninety percent of startups fail. So let filmmakers know that you know um, most films fail. Go into that knowing it. Uh, if you're not willing to accept failure, then you'll never make something original because you're gonna be constantly trying to make something that's gonna please people, which means it's gonna be based on what already exists. And if you're not willing to go out on a limb, then you're not gonna succeed. So you gotta be willing to accept, there's a good chance I'm gonna fail. You know, I was saying it earlier, Frey, I expected nobody was gonna watch it. Um, and I got lucky, people did. Um, with this one, I hope people want to watch it, but there's a part of me that's really braced for it to just tank. I have no idea, and I would never want to go into a film expecting it to be a success because then you're just setting yourself up for disappointment. So that would be, that'd be my thing is the, the accept failure, 
learn from it and know that failure is what leads to originality. Um, and then learn business. 